What's up, friends? My name is Robert Ardute from yaymath.org. And today, we're going to do something I've never done before. We're going to create an entire video on the course of algebra in one continuous flow. This will be a personal challenge for me. I've never done anything like this. But more importantly, this is for you. This is my offering to those students, maybe you're one of them, who's preparing for a test or a final exam, maybe a standardized test. Maybe you're watching lots of different videos to prepare for that exam. And I thought, what better way to help you than to create an entire flow, a continuous flow of algebra so that you can see it from beginning to end, okay? If you are one of those students, I just want to send a message to you directly, okay? I was up late last night preparing this. There's a lot of work. You're probably up late preparing for your exam. And before we get going, I just want to invite you to just do your best and know that whatever the result of this test is, it is separate from your core identity. It's separate from your value as a human being. All right, the test is the test. The result is the result. But you are whole. You are enough. You are more than enough. And with that comes the freedom, the safety to just put your best foot forward and let the result be the result and know that everything's gonna work out one way or another, okay? Let's partner up, let's do this together. Join me at the board and good luck, all right? Rock on. All right, before we get going, I just wanna give special thanks to my friends and partners at Carnegie Learning, who's responsible for creating this beautiful studio space and they've empowered me to make this video. All right, deep breath needed, algebra one. The whole course at once, we got this. All right, let's go to work. Thanks for taking this journey with me. Starting from the very, <laughs> very beginning with my first mistake, which is about classifying different types of numbers. All right, so let's talk about it. When you're a little kid and you're learning to count, you count as one, two, three, four, five, right? Let's make this a little thicker. Boom, one, two, three, four, five, and so forth. Right, and I think of this as a little kid learning to count as the most natural act. So these would be the natural numbers, okay? And then after that, you grow up, you get a little bigger, and you learn about the presence of zero, right? Zero is a number that you start to learn when you're a little kid. So if you include zero to that, and then one, two, three, four, five, let's go a little bigger there, all right? Zero, one, two, three, four, five. Right, and I think of the zero as a whole number, right? The letter O, we'll put that as whole numbers. And then you get a little older after you learn one, two, three, and then the presence of zero, right? And you start to learn about numbers that are less than one, right? Those are called the integers. So that'll be a negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, three, and so forth. Right? So you learn about, oh, you could go below zero, like below ground or something like that, or below sea level. And these are called integers. Okay? And then you get a little older. And with that, you learn about the presence of the numbers, maybe between these, maybe all the fractions, all the decimals that repeat or end, let's say one half or 0 0.3, 3 tenths or even decimals that repeat, you know, one third is the same as 0 0.3 repeating. Any of these, any decimal with a pattern or repeating, any fraction, these are called rational numbers. And the reason for this uh, circular format is that if you're a natural number, you're automatically whole, integer, and rational. See how it works inside out. If you're a whole number, you're automatically integer or rational. Right? If you're rational, you might be natural, but you might not be. You might be one of these fraction things, okay? So if you're inside at the center of the target, you're all of them, okay? And these numbers are compared to, there's other types of numbers as well that are outside this. They're called irrational. And those are numbers like pi, right? Pi, you may know, 3.1415, and it keeps going on and on forever with no pattern, all right? So those are decimals that go on forever with no pattern and no, no end. 
Another one would be square roots, for example, square root of two, 1.4, on and on and on and on and on, all right? So those are irrational numbers. And all of these together are real numbers, which is what I hope this experience together will be real. Let's do it. Okay, let's go to work some more, starting with what are called the order of operations, the order in which we do math operations, right? You may have heard this acronym, PEMDAS, right? PEMDAS stands for parentheses, exponents, multiplication, then division, then addition, and then subtraction. Subtraction. Good. All right. So let's see if we could do those specific orders according to this list. So you'll notice I don't have any parentheses in, in this case, but I do have an exponent, which is next on the hierarchy. 2 to the power of 3 means 2 times 2 times 2, and that would be 8. So you could throw an 8 down here. And then for clarity, it helps to maybe write down each step as you go. See that? So I'm honoring the, the original problem, and I'm going piece by piece, taking one bite at a time of the problem. What's next in the hierarchy? I see addition, I see subtraction, but prior to that would be a division, right? So let's do this division next. 8 divided by 2 is 4, so it would be 11 plus 4 minus 8. And also what's interesting about addition and subtraction, right? They don't necessarily matter the order in which you do them because this could be also adding a negative. So in a sense, you could just, you know, add left to right. So let's go 11 plus 4 is 15 minus 8 would be 7, final answer. Let's do this one. All right, notice we have a fraction separating two quantities. 3 squared is that exponent. That's first over there. That would be 9. 11 minus 9 divided by 11 plus 6. Let's go ahead and simplify these or evaluate. 11 minus 9, 2 divided by 17. All right, 2 seventeenths can't simplify further, and we are moving. Order of operations, continuing the game. In this case, we're just going to use these particular values of variables A, B, and C, and then we'll do our order of operation dance. How do you eat an elephant? <sighs> One bite at a time. Let's go. So A is 10, that's 10 times. B is a half, throw it. Minus C squared would be negative three squared. That's important. Okay, let's talk about it. By order of operations, let's go ahead and evaluate this exponent. Negative three squared times itself. Negative times negative is positive. So that would be a minus nine. So this problem was done by design. Don't be that student that goes, oh, double negative and positive. Remember that the exponent takes priority in order of operations, then we'll include the minus after, okay? So that exponent's kind of selfish. Give it. Let's go over here. 10 times a half, or half of 10 would be 5. 5 take away 9, negative 4. Okay, probably should have water. <clears throat> but it's okay. Let's keep going. I'll probably get some water soon. A plus C is 10 plus negative 3 squared over 1 half. Parentheses first, then exponent. 10 plus negative 3 is 7 squared divided by 1 half. 7 squared, 49 divided by 1 half. This is something we're going to do later today. Oof, let's get some water. You know that over there? I have friends. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And I, <clears throat> I'm feeling you. I don't know. It's maybe a channel. Oh, that helped. Self care. Self care. So whenever you divide by a fraction, it's the same as multiplying by its reciprocal 49 times the reciprocal of one half, which is two over one, which is two, and then 49 times two, see that divided by a half, multiplied by reciprocal, that would be 98. We're gonna talk about that later today. Dividing by a fraction is the same as multiplying by that fraction's reciprocal. Onward and upward, here we go. Okay, these are called properties 
And we're going to do an example of all of these right now, okay? So let's break them down one at a time. Commutative property. When I think of commute, I think of moving around. Let's say your morning commute to school or to work. So when I think of commuting, let's say A plus B, do you agree is the same if I move them around? What if B was in front of A? That's commutative property. See how B and A moved? And it's the same thing. You could say five plus eight does equal eight plus five. Commutative also works for multiplication. Let's say if you multiply five times eight, that's the same as eight times five. See that? So commutative, think, moving things around. Associative, I think of associating, I think of friends. So let's do our friends with A and B. Let's say A and B are friends, they are associating. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna go different colors. So it kind of like looks beautiful for you. Let's say A and B are associating, they're different. There you go, A plus B plus C. If you add A and B first and then add C, it's the same thing as if B and C added first. See that? B and C are homies, they're associating, and then add A on top of that. The same thing works with mult multiplicative. So you could do A times B times C, and that's the same as B times C as well. There you go. Okay? Notice the parentheses moved, but not the order. That's important. Onward! Additive identity. When I think of identity, I think of who I am at my core. And your identity, maybe when you're a child, all the way to adulthood, maybe who you are at the core, your essence, right? That special flame, that spark inside you is always the same. And so what could I add, let's say to A, such that it remains A? See that? I am who I am. I'm not going to change, ultimately, my identity. And so that would be plus zero, right? Multiplicative identity, there's that word again. What can you multiply to something so that it doesn't change? There it is, A times one. Beautiful. And now inverse. Inverse has an implication of changing. So this time, what are we going to add to A such that it becomes zero? The inverse of A, some people call it the opposite. What would you call the opposite of A? That would be negative A, okay? And in this case, multiplicative inverse. What's funny about these is that there are two inverses, but they end up in different things. So this is not easy stuff, right? I really sympathize. In this case, when you're multiplying with an inverse, you're actually gonna multiply to one, right? Can you think of what you'd multiply A by? so that it results in one? The answer to that is the reciprocal of whatever A is, right? The reciprocal of A, technically A over one, is one over A, throw it down. So that's multiplicative inverse. Symmetric, symmetric, <laughs> symmetric. It's like we're both being challenged here. I don't know, I'm, I'm vibing on that, on that front. Thanks for taking the challenge with me. Symmetric property, when I think of symmetry, let's say the human body, that da Vinci drawing of the human body, maybe symmetric more or less on the left and right, all right? So you could say, for example, that um, if A equals B, right? Like one half of my body is kind of symmetric to the other half, then it's safe to say that I could put the B on the left. Often this is confused with commutative. I got those confused first. But commutative actually is changing the order of plus or changing the order of times. Symmetric, you jump over the equals, right? See that B jumped to the left side and the A jumped to the right, okay? Multiplicative property of zero, hopefully that's easy money, right? What do you multiply A by so that it results in zero? What do you multiply anything by so the results in zero? Zero. Distributive property, you might have seen this before. Let's throw it down. Let's go four times x plus two. So that four would multiply to every term inside the parentheses. Is the same as four x plus four times two is eight. Let's do a tradition mandate so you go like that. All right, and when I see transitive property, I think of the train. 
Let's talk about the train. Let's say I'm at stop A. Let's go if. Let's say I get on at stop A, and then I get off the train at stop B, get off the train. Then I'm already at stop B or at that station. From B, I get on the train and I go to stop C. Is it safe to say that if you start at A, you'll end at C? It's true. Transitive property states that A would have to be equal to C. Transitive property, the train. Stop and go. Rock and roll. Next. Okay, our work continues. Ah, good. So we have a distributive property lined up for us. We just did that moments ago. And then we have a bunch of different equations to solve. Okay, let's do it. So four times X and then four times negative 20 would be four X. Four times negative 20 is negative 80. Rocking. Let's distribute negative two Y, boom, to five X and negative two Y to positive four. Negative two Y times five X would be negative 10 X Y. Negative two Y times positive four would be negative eight Y. Okay. Good, some of that early algebra stuff is okay, right? You just sort of know the property and fly. Now, solve means get x by itself. Sometimes you can solve in one step. Sometimes you need more than one step. So let's talk about that now. What would we need to do to both sides of all these equations to get x by itself? In this case, x is not by itself because negative eight is in x's house. And X wants to be alone. X needs quiet time. I want, X wants to isolate. So be like, negative eight, could you like maybe leave? And so negative eight has to leave X's house by the opposite act of negative eight. The opposite of minus eight would be plus eight on both sides. Negative eight plus eight, gone. X equals whatever 12 plus eight is, is 20. Keep in mind also, friends, that you can do these logically, okay? I don't want to squash your mental brain aptitude. What number minus 8 equals 12? That number would be 20. What number divided by 4 is 6? You might know that number, and I celebrate that with you, okay? In those times that you don't know what the number is right off the bat, we're using algebra acts or, or functions to both sides of the equation to get x by itself. So let's do that again. Opposite of divided by four. Opposite of divided by four is times four. So we have to do whatever we do to one side, we do the other side. That's incredibly important in terms of the balance of algebra. Algebra is defined as to restore and rebalance. That's the literal Arabic definition of algebra. And so if you multiply one side of an equation by four, you got to multiply the other side by four and the scale is balanced. The equation is still true. Times four divided by four, or four divided by four, is one, leaving just x. Six times four is 24. You may have said that moments ago, that x was 24. All right, we're rocking it. Now, do you know two thirds of what number minus seven plus, or equals five? I don't. So we're gonna do algebra to both sides. Let's do isolating x. We're gonna go plus seven on both sides to get rid of that gown. So we got, Two thirds of a number equals five plus seven is 12. Two thirds of what number is 12? Well, let's find out. Let's find out what we're gonna do. The inverse operation or the opposite of times two thirds to X, like we said, is reciprocal. The multiplicative inverse times the reciprocal of two over three, is three over two times three over two. Look at that. Three divided by itself is one. Two divided by itself is one, leaving just one X or X. And now you could say three halves of 12 or 12 divided by two is six, common factor of two, six and one. See that? Now we multiply across and that answer is 18. Two thirds of 18 is 12. All right, let's explore the space, baby. All right, so what can we do to both sides to get X to be a little closer to being by itself? Let's subtract six, kind of like we did over there. There we go, minus six on both sides. And we're left with negative 10 over X equals 
1 minus 6, negative 5. Negative 10 divided by what is negative 5? You may know that. In case we don't, one thing that we can do to resolve the fact that this is a fraction, just like we've resolved fractions by multiplying by fractions, we can multiply, let's say, both sides by x. Check this out. If you multiply both sides by x, x divided by x is 1, basically goes to 1, leaving negative 10 equals negative 5x, and then divide both sides by negative 5, the opposite of times negative 5, divide by negative 5. There you go. Five, negative 5 divided by itself is gone. It's 1x equals, this is positive 2. Wow, okay. Moving along. Let's do this one. Oh, we got a graph going, okay? We're going to talk about relations and functions. I'm going to define that with you now, and we're going to do it in a variety of different ways, and we're going to talk about this notation called f of x. Starting with a graph. So a good way to think of a graph, here we go, beautiful. Let's say I wanted to relate the time, put the time here, oops. Time and the temperature, this guy here. All right, what time of day it is and what temperature it is. And then I have a bunch of data points, let's say over here, right there, one of those, and then one of those and then one of those, and one of those. So that could be like one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock. And let's say this could be potentially, I don't know, maybe uh, 40 degrees, and then 50 degrees, and 60 degrees, all right? So this is a relation in the form of a graph. Okay, this is a graph, and we can transfer this data into a table. So what would that look like? You could say that x is the time, and y is the temperature, and our values are at 1 o'clock, it's 40 degrees, and at 2 o'clock, it's 50 degrees, and at 3 o'clock, it's also 50 degrees, and at four o'clock, it's 60 degrees. So this is a relation relating time and temperature in the form of a table. We got that. Now let's do what's called a mapping. You may have seen that before. It looks like circles in a way. So you have time here and you have temperature. You put the values down. So you have values of one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, and four o'clock. And in here you have 40 degrees. 50 degrees, 60 degrees, and then you have these little, at one, it's 40 degrees, at two o'clock, it's 50, at three o'clock, it's 50, and at four o'clock, it's 60. Okay, cool. And finally, we have what's called the vertical line test. The vertical line test is whether something is a function. Let me ask you a question. Is this possible in real life? Is it possible Potentially at one o'clock, it could be 40 degrees, then warm up and stay that way, and then even get warmer at four. I think it's possible. I think it's possible temperature can stay. So this technically functions so far. But you know what wouldn't function, friends? Let me show you. What wouldn't function, let's put it in like this orange one here. This one. Look at that. That would mean that at four o'clock, let's say, it's also 70. Imagine you're feeling the temperature and someone's like, hey, like, what's the temperature like? And you check your device and it's like, oh, it's um, 60 and 70 degrees today. You'd be like, what? You mean like today and tomorrow or today and yesterday? You're like, no, 60 and 70 degrees. No one would ever say that, that there's two different temperatures for one particular time. This is not realistic. This does not function. So the definition of a function is you can't have the same x value or initial like um, independent value, starting value, leading to different y values. This does not function. This is not possible. And what we mean by vertical line test is if you draw any vertical line and hit twice, 
You fail the vertical line test and you're not a function. So the giveaway is look for repeated x's. If you have repeated x's for different y's, that's not realistic. It's not possible to say it's 60 and 70 degrees at the same time. So this would not be a function. Let's put that down. Not a function. Beautiful. All right. Now let's talk about functions. All right. So when you say a function of x is that for any particular x value, you can see here in red, you would insert that x value into the function that's called 3x minus 2. So let's think of different x values that we can insert or substitute in for x. So if f of x equals 3x plus 2, f of 10 is 3 times 10 minus 2. Throw it down. Okay? And f of 10, or 3 times 10 minus 2, would be 30 minus 2 is 28. So that would be 28. f of 10 is 28. Let's do it again. If f of x is 3 times x minus 2, f of 0 is 3 times 0 minus 2. See that? Just throw it down right there. 3 times 0 is 0. Minus 2 is negative 2. So when x is 0 in this function, the function results in negative 2. Think about what f of 5 would be while I throw it down. f of 5 is 3 times 5 minus 2. 15 minus 2 is 13. All right, we'll do a couple more. We could also insert negatives. Let's do that. 3 times, all right? Wherever you see x, you insert these values, no matter what the function is. So yeah, I could do it all. I can go in factory mode at this moment. Okay, f of negative 1 is... 3 times negative 1 minus 2 is negative 3 minus 2 is negative 5. 3 times a minus 2 is 3a minus 2. And you could do f of anything. And my favorite of all time is f of banana, because if you could do f of banana, you could do f of anything. If f of x is 3x minus 2, f of banana is 3 banana minus 2. All right. Great work so far. Let's keep going. All right, onward. Now we're going to be talking about equations. The first step is to translate an English statement into the language of math, an equation that represents this sentence. The sum of three times a number and two is 14. So that's a mouthful, right? Let's break it down piece by piece. The word sum means plus. The sum of three times a number and two. So three times a number, that would be x in this case, and two, there it is. Now it helps to see after the fact, this is the sum of three times some number and two is translates into equals 14. All right, we did it. Now we have an additional equation, more than one equation, and the difference here compared to what we did previously is that you see the variables on both sides. So that creates a bit more of a challenge. But we got this. We got this. So here we go. Um, hmm, this divided by 2, I would love to resolve. So we're going to do the inverse operation times 2 on both sides. And in doing so, you have to distribute, multiply 2 times the entire side. In fact, we can demonstrate that here. All right, rocking. So 2 divided by itself, gone. And we get 6x plus 1 equals 2 distributed to x minus 3. That would be 2x minus 6. All right, let's do stuff to both sides to get x by itself. I'm going to bring the x's to the left. Let's go subtract 2x on both sides. Gaon. Let's move that 1 over, minus 1 both sides. And that's gone. And what do we have? 4x equals negative 6 minus 1 is negative 7. All right, let's go here. And then divide both sides by 4 to isolate x. Gaon, x equals negative 7 fourths. All right, let's see if we can do it again. This time, ooh, okay. All right, I see you. So we have a little distributive property. And we also have a distribu distribution of the negative sign 
technically that's distributing negative one. Some students like to see that negative one there. All right, here we go. Distributing four. La, 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 la. Hopefully it becomes systematic. You know, you know the tools and you implement. Distributing four, there it is. Minus four plus six equals distributing the negative through the x and positive 16 would become negative x minus 16. All right, there you go. Let's do that same dance, isolating x. I'm gonna bring x this time on the left again. Gown. And we have combining like terms. So let's go piece by piece. This is 5x. Combine like terms. Negative 4 plus 6 is 2 equals negative 16. We're almost done with this one. Subtract 2 on both sides. This is gone here. 5x equals negative 16. Take away 2 is further down, negative 18. And finally, divide both sides by 5. To isolate x, and you get x equals negative 18 fifths. Improper fraction doesn't simplify anymore. There's no common factors. So on algebra, you can kind of leave that. Okay, we're moving. All right, we have more equations. This time, it says three consecutive integers sum to or add to 48. What are those numbers? So look, again, we've talked about just using your brain before. Can you think of consecutive numbers, meaning in a row, like five, six, and seven, such that when we add them, it would be 48? I don't think five plus six plus seven adds to 48. You could try things like 10, 11, 12. I don't think that would add to 48 either. So you could do this mentally, or we can use algebra, right? That's part of the tools, right? The unknown value, x, is the first number. So a consecutive integer, the next number is whatever x is plus one. See that? That's the language of it. Whatever x is, x plus one is the next consecutive integer. So that would be the second number. And then one more beyond that would be the third, third number. So let's sum them up. x plus, x plus one plus x plus two should add to 48. See, what's cool about this is that it takes the guesswork out. All right, now all we gotta do is combine like terms. x plus x plus x is three x plus one plus two is plus three equals 48. Subtract three on both sides. Gaon, three x, go over here. Three x equals, what is that, 45? Divide by three and x equals 15. The problem's not done though, because if x is 15, that's the first number. So if the first number is 15, then the next consecutive one is 16, and the one after that is 17. And 15 plus 16 plus 17 should be 48. We can confirm 15 plus 16 is 31 plus 17 would be 48. Now, it's the similar type of problem. We're still summing to 48, three consecutive even integers. Again, we could kind of go through our mind what it would be, or we can use algebra. Let's go ahead and do that now. Let's set x be the first number. So the next even one, let's say you're at the number 10, the next even one or 12 would be two more than x, not one more, two more. And then the next even one would be two more than this. Can you guess what it would be? X plus four. Third number. All right, here we go. Let's sum them up this time. So we have X plus X plus two plus X plus four would sum to 48 this time. And now let's add them up. This time it's 3x plus 6. You see, it's kind of interesting. There's a common thread in the fashion of the problem, even though we're going to get different answers for x. Take away 6 from both sides. That would be 42. And then divide both sides by 3. What's that? 14. Wow, very similar. But now it's even numbers. So if x is 14, add to 16, add to 18, rock and roll, add them up. These two should, these add to 30 plus 18 is 48. 
All right, good work. Thanks for joining me on the journey. Let's keep it going. Ooh, okay, so we're gonna do some absolute value equations, but look, first let's talk about absolute value is. So absolute value is technically defined as how far a number is from zero, but I think of it more as a positive machine, a positive machine. So if you put the number four into the positive machine, four is already positive, so it remains four, all right? Just keep it positive. Let's talk about negative four. If you put negative four into the positive machine, it gets washed and rinsed and it becomes positive four as well, okay? Check this out. A common mistake is like we get too um, antsy or quick to make things positive. So this is not going to be 15 plus one, all right? You do all the math, all the order of operations inside the absolute value, and then you evaluate that number, right? So if we talked about PEMDAS before, order of operations, absolute value goes after, and so PEMDAS's little sister is named PEMDASA. <laughs> This is for absolute value, or PEMDASAV. There you go. PEMDASAV, come to dinner. So 15 minus one is 14. Absolute value of 14, positive machine is 14. Let's do the math. Two minus five first, right? We do the additions first, <laughs> is negative three. Absolute value of negative three is positive three. Okay. So now let's talk about the equations that we have our feet kind of into the waters of absolute value. What we're basically saying is that the absolute value of x minus two would have to result in six. So would it make sense that inside the absolute value, it would be awesome if it resulted in six, right? If this all together became six, it would become the absolute value of six, which is six. So what you do is you write a one statement that x minus two hopefully results in six. But based on our knowledge of absolute value, we also know that if the absolute value of negative six, I don't want black, here we go here. If there is a negative six in here, right? Wouldn't the absolute value of negative six also be six? And that would be true. So that x minus two itself not only can result in the number positive six, it also can result in the number negative six. All right, there is a split action and that split has a technical name. It's called bifurcate. Bifurcate to split into two, the prefix bi means two. And I always thought that bifurcate is the way that mathematicians say they end relationships. What happened? Oh, we bifurcated. So that's the way I see the word bifurcate. Split into two. Okay, it's for the best. <laughs> All right, adding two to both sides. La, 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 la. Boom, x equals eight. And then add two to both sides again to isolate x. And x equals negative four. All right, it's true that x can be two different things. Right, if you plugged it in, eight minus two is six. Absolute value of six is six. Check, negative four minus two is negative six. Absolute value of that number is six. All right, we're gonna do it again. Let's bifurcate, all right? Mathematically, not relationship-wise. Here we go. What should two x minus one equal? Two x minus one can equal 11. You think of the other number that two x minus one can be? Two x minus one can equal negative 11. Rock in, let's solve both. Okay, we're gonna add one to both sides. Look at this, I'm doing factory model, friends. Right? I always like to think that if people do this, if you like what I just did, my prediction about you is you like salad with dinner, not salad before dinner. Is that true? Think about it. <laughs> do you like it all at once? All right, this becomes 12 and you get x equals six. See that two x equals 12. Next, let's continue our full course. Two x equals negative 11 plus one, carefully is negative 10, and x equals negative five. How about that? Two answers for x are six and negative five. One more, okay, hmm, suspect. 
Do you agree that absolute value always results in a positive number? Since we said it's the positive machine, absolute value could also result in zero. That's true too. But if we agree that this absolute value, this thing, the result of this thing is always going to be positive. I'm just going to write positive with the knowledge it's like positive or zero. Let's put that. Right? Absolute value will always result in a positive number or zero. So how can it ever result in something negative? It's impossible. You could even try. Try as hard as you can. What would x have to be to make this equation true? No matter how hard we try, this whole thing will become positive at the end of the day because of absolute value afterwards. And there's no way it can result in negative. So this is our first instance of no solution. Fancy symbol, boom, right? The answer here is that there is no answer. Wow, that's deep. Let's do some practice with ratios. Okay, this is a ratio. Is it true that six eighths of something is the same as three fourths? If I said I ate six eighths of pizza and you said, oh, I ate three fourths. Is it true we ate the same amount? It's true, right? What you can see is that ratios operate on this concept of you can multiply the numerator and denominator by the same amount or divide and the ratio would still hold, all right? So let's see, three-fourths top times two, bottom times two, it works. See that? Three times two is six, four times two is eight. So we can confirm that as well. Yeah, there's a fun way to do it, right? So you can go in this direction. That's the giveaway, detectives. Four times what is 16? So you could go times four in the denominator, thus times four in the numerator. Three times four would be 12, right? So that's a way to say that x equals 12, right? This time, it is possible to traverse with multiplication or division. Another great strategy that people use is this concept of cross multiply, okay? Cross multiply would state if you have two fractions that are equal to each other, the product or the result of multiplying these two, let's say six times five is 30, is the same as the product as these two. Four times x is four x. And then we have an equation to solve with no fractions. Holla, uh, x. I think I'm warmed up now. Are you? Dropped in. All right, 30 divided by four. Well, this is four doesn't go into 30 evenly. Common factor of two would be 15 halves. All right, now we have Percent of change. Mm. Okay, so percent of change. I picked these numbers on purpose. All right, my first job, you know, when I started working, my salary was 40,000, true story. And then I did well enough to be offered a raise to 45,000. I wanted more money. I didn't get it. And the reason they told me is that they said it was a large percentage of growth. Let's talk about what that percentage is. We can see that we did add $5,000. So it's a growth of $5,000. And that 5,000 is a ratio or compared to what it started as, which is 40,000, right? So we have to compare what 5,000 is to what it started. This would give us the ratio, which will lead to the percent of change, the percent of growth, All right? To be official about it, a very like kind of a down and dirty uh, equation for a percent of change would be the difference of the two, let's throw it down, diff over 40K, which is the original. Diff over a ridge. All right, little nuts and bolts equation. So let's go thousands divided by thousands, right, is one. So this is five fortieths. And then this also can go down to one eighth, but I want percent, so we're gonna convert one eighth into its decimal form, one divided by eight. All right, 0 0.125 represented as a decimal is 12.5%, two decimal places. And that's exactly what they told me. They said, well, we can't give you more money because this represents more than a 10% of growth. And they're like, oh, got me. Okay, sometimes numbers decrease. So we could call this growth. And then this one will be a percent of decrease or like down, a diminishment. 
Let's do that same formula, just jumping right into it. What is the difference, friends? 12. 12 as it relates to 80. Throw it down, straighten the calc, let's go. 12 divided by 80 is 0 0.15, 15 hundredths. Move it twice again. So that would be 15% of decrease, right? So you could think of this, this was a salary change of growth. This could be perhaps a, an item that we buy. Let's say it starts at 80 bucks and goes to $68. That would mean it's on sale or discounted by 15% of its original amount. Let's do more. Ooh, practice with percent of change, okay? Sometimes the books and the tests, they give these in different formats. What would $60 plus 8% more be? So there's many ways to do this. I like to lean into the calculator now because it's a great method to, to understand how to do it for all types of problems, okay? So 8%, if we're gonna go from percent now back to decimal, would be 8 hundredths, like that. So I want $60 plus 8% of 60. So the word of, you may or may not know, is kind of code for times in math land. 8% of would be 8% times 60. This will give us the calculation of 8% of 60. Let's do it. 0 0.08 times 60, and we get 4.84 dollars and 80 cents plus the original 60. This could be maybe a sales tax, perhaps. So if you bought something for $60 plus an 8% sales tax, that would be $64 and 80 cents. All right, cool. One more way I'm going to show you how to do this is that if you add 8%, it's 108% total. I'm going to do that over here. So 60 times 108%, oops, is the same as 60. What is the decimal version of 108% is 1.08. And if we were to put this in the calculator, we would get our final amount, 64.80. The reason that's helpful is that if we're subtracting 10% off of 60, what percent is left if you take 10% off, let's say again on a discount? If you take 10% away, you might imagine that 90% remains. So one could do the following. Pro tip, I want 90% of this. And that would entail a 10% drop. Rockin', what's 90% as a decimal point? Nine, we'll even throw it, this is 90%. Lovely. 60 times 0.9 as I sway back and forth. 54! And it also use your common sense. This number better be less than 60 because we're reducing. So keep, keep your mind engaged in case we make slips of the hand. Speaking of which, I might make a slip of the hand here. These ones are challenging. We're solving for indicated variables, in this case, B2. This happens to be the equation for the area of a trapezoid. What if I wanted to know what B2 is? Isolating B2. B2 wants space. B2 wants to be left alone. So we need to do stuff to both sides to make B2 alone. So the first thing I could think of is this one half. I can multiply both sides by two. Click, clack, resulting in 2a equals two times one half is one, leaving it alone, h, b1 plus b2. All right, well, I want to access this b2, but it's trapped by the times h. So the opposite of times h would be dividing both sides by h. H divided by itself is gown, and we have 2a over h equals b1 plus b2. All right, we're one step away to getting b2 by itself. The only reason b2 is not by itself is the b1, and then we could subtract b1 on both sides. That's the first base of the trapezoid. All right, and then we have b2. Let's bring it b2 on the left. I just did the symmetric property. I brought this stuff on the right, 
to the stuff on the left. And these are non-like terms, so we write it as is. 2a over h, they don't combine, minus b1. Wow, yeah? All right. It's challenging stuff, you know? Credit to you. Credit to you for learning. It's harder to be you than me in this moment, so credit to you for that. Okay, because you have to learn this stuff. That's what I mean. Let's solve for b. Well, I would multiply both sides by b to res resolve the fraction thing, but this problem is created on purpose. This minus c, you'd have to multiply entirely everything by b, including the minus c, and that would make more complication. So rather than that, let's add c to both sides. So we go plus c here, plus c here, gaon. And now we'll be left with, let's pick a different color, 2x plus a over b equals d plus c. Now let's multiply both sides by b, and that will resolve the fraction. Boom. So that goes, click, click, and we get 2x plus a equals. Now one could distribute the b, no harm, no foul. There's no real purpose in doing so. So I'm just gonna leave it undistributed. And in fact, I'm gonna put the B in the front. I just did commutative property. I changed the order of the multiplication, moving things around, commuting, D plus C. All right, still getting, oh, yes. I'm so glad that I didn't distribute. That's great. I didn't keep track of the B that I wanted. So now I can do that in one shot. What would I do to both sides to get b by itself? I would divide by d plus c, the whole factor, d plus c. d plus c divided by itself is one, it's gone. So we finally get b equals two x plus a over d plus c, cook in. Okay, more, here we go. Okay, it's time to graph. All right, we're gonna graph some ordered pairs. This is in the terms of x and then y. There they are, we have four to graph. So let's practice that. All right, here we go. Boop. Oh, we got a graph, friends. Okay, zero, two, put it down. When x is zero, let's say x and y. X is zero, no movements to the left or right. Y is two, that's two up. Boom, one. Three to the right, one up. Three to the right, one down. One, two, three, one down. And then three to the left, right? X is a lefty-righty movement. That's left three, up one. One, two, three to the left, up one. There are those four ordered pairs, four points. Now let's talk about this concept of x and y intercepts. Join me over here. All right, x and y intercepts, we'll go over here. Blip, yeah. So define an x-intercept, define a y-intercept. Well, if you think it through, an x-intercept is where you hit the x-axis and a y-intercept is when you hit the y-axis. Let's start with the y-intercept, for example. Any point along the y-axis would have to have the same x value. Can you tell me what the x value is at any point on the y-axis? It would have to be zero. It would have to be zero. Think it through. x is zero here, x is zero here, x is zero here. Even way down here, x is always zero on the y-axis. So as a rule, we know that the y-intercept is when x is zero. So what is y when x is zero? We can substitute zero in for x. Zero minus two y equals six. And see that? We're solving for y for a known value of x. Zero minus two y is negative two y equals six. Divide both sides by negative two, and y would happen to be negative three. All right, so we found one. Okay x-intercept, x-intercept. When you hit the x-axis, what's true? This time about y, y is what now? y is zero. So let's do the same thing. We have x 
plus or minus, excuse me, two times zero equals six. See that this time I set y to zero to find what x would be. x minus two times zero, two times zero is zero. x minus zero is zero, x equals six. Boom, there it is. So the x-intercept is six, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, there it is. And then we can make a little line that goes through it. Beautiful. Now let's graph x plus y equals three. So there's many ways to graph. I'm gonna show you the skeleton key, like the, the one that works for all different types of graphs. And that would be plotting points, similar to what we've been doing, but just making it more formal. All I'm gonna ask you to do is come up with x, y pairs that make the equation true. So I'm thinking of numbers randomly. Let's say when x is two. When x is two, two plus one equals three. Two plus one equals three. Or you could set y to two. So if y was two, x would have to be one. Or you could set x to zero, right? Just like before, this would be a y-intercept. Do you agree? Because x is zero. When x is zero, zero plus what equals three? Y would have to be three. See, so look, you could do this infinitely many times. In fact, you could even do negative numbers. What about when x is five? Five plus what equals three? Can you think of that number? Five plus what negative number equals three? Five plus negative two. And this will become a line. Observe, two, one, throw it down. Two right, one up. One, two, boom. Zero, three, yeah, it's lining up nicely. And then five, negative two, one, two, three, four, five, to the right, two down. All right, there's our line, all right? So plotting points works great for lines. It works great for all graphs, right? You could plot points. All right, look at that, crushing. Let's go more. Let's talk about slope. All right, when I was living in Malibu, there was a canyon drive that went down to Pacific Coast Highway, and this was the sign I saw. It's called a gradient or a grade. 8% grade is the slope of the road. Why is that? 8% is expressed as percent or out of 100. That's eight out of 100. And eight out of 100 is a slope. Slope is informally defined as a rise value over a run, meaning how far up and down something goes compared to how far left and right, right? Rise, up and down, run means horizontally. And so that road, you could say, was eight feet of rise right here, the road would change vertically by eight feet for every 100 feet of horizontal change. And that may not seem like worth, like needing a sign for that, but it really is. Eight feet in terms of a car is a very big vertical drop, enough to need to put a sign for it, okay? So a rise over run, a change of eight over a change of 100. So now let's talk about this graph. We have two points given, and then we wanna transform this into slope-intercept form. I'm gonna put slope-intercept form up for us so we can analyze it together. Y equals mx plus b, where m is the slope and b is the y-intercept. Let's throw that down so you have it with you. This is slope and b is the y-intercept. Okay, let's get a graph going. All right, zero, two, zero, two would be up two that way. And then three, six would be three to the right, one, two, three, four, five, six. All right, and then we have this particular line that goes through it. Okay, which one is the low hanging fruit? Well, it looks like the y-intercept is known. We're crossing the y-axis here and indeed confirm that x is zero. So is it safe to say that the y-intercept is none other than two? So you're encouraged, you're invited to create equations in pieces, especially those pieces that speak to you first, okay? So if you know the y-intercept, you can go straight to two. Don't always have to go left to right. All right, let's put it down. Y equals, now all we need is the slope. Slope is rise over run. Let's talk about it. How far up or down we go 
to get from point to point compared to how far left or right we have to go. So let's count it off. Let's say we start at the y-intercept or we begin there, right? Here we go. The rise is the y's. So rise would be up one, two, three, four. I count a rise of four, positive four. So that'd be four over. A run looks like we're going to the right. Right in X land, right means a positive movement, numbers getting bigger, and left would be negative. Over to the right, one, two, three, there it is. So this slope has four thirds. The equation of the line Y equals four thirds X plus two. Okay, we're gonna do a lot more of that now, so get on the line. Okay, it's, now we're given this equation. We're comfortable with slope-intercept form based on the previous page, so we're just gonna graph that up here. All right, where shall we begin? Let's begin at the y-intercept of negative one. I love math jokes, <laughs> and it's helpful for learning. Y-intercept of negative one, good place to begin. Negative three appears to be the slope. Let's think of it as a ratio, rise over run. If I insisted that you make the number negative three into a fraction, it would be negative three over one, and that helps. So now from our y-intercept, our rise is down three, one, two, three, and our run is positive one, meaning one to the right, and that would be the line, all right? One could even go up three, one, two, three, and left one, right? And that slope would be three over negative one. See that mathematically, that would be also be the same as negative three. So we're cool with that. So there's our line in slope intercept form, y equals negative three x minus one. Onward. Ooh, okay. Now we're given some data. We're given the slope of a line and a point that it crosses through. And we want to write the form of the line, two different ways, one called point slope form and one slope intercept, which we've seen. Point slope form is cool. I'll show you why it's really cool. Point slope form works in such a way in that if you had the slope of the line, it's lurking right here as a coefficient of x minus something. So the slope would go there. X minus what and Y minus what? X minus an X value of a point. So this would be a point. We call that X1, Y1, meaning it's one point on the line. Here it is, X1, Y1, and here's Y1. So this is the original formula for an equation in point slope form. It's a little cryptic by itself, but once we plug stuff into it, you'll start to see that it's very useful. Here we go. We know the slope, it goes right there. The slope is a half, we throw it down. And we know the point in question, x1, y1 would be negative four, three. So x1 would be negative four in this case, and y1 would be three, right? And if you know about x minus negative four, a double negative, x minus a negative number would be positive, and thus, minus negative four is technically plus four. So there it is, point slope form. This is the line that has a slope of one half and crosses the point negative four, three. And what's great is that this can smoothly transition into slope intercept form. Let's show you how. We can distribute the half and isolate y, and then we'll have y equals mx plus b. Let's do. So we go half times x and a half times positive four, and we'll get y minus three equals one half x, one half times four is plus two. We are one step away to getting y by itself, and that would be by adding three to both sides. Gone, and lo and behold, we get our second equation, which is y equals one half x plus five. There are two forms. That's your point slope and that's your slope intercept. Okay, so point slope often is a great entry point to getting slope intercept. All right, onward.
Let's do it again. Ooh, now we're given two points. The slope is unknown. And we want point slope form and slope intercept form and standard form. Sorry, we're getting you ready, okay? Totally everything all at once. So we really would love that slope. Let's get the slope together. All right, slope between two points, what do you think? M equals. Well, if it's a rise over a run, the rise means the change in the y values, the change in up and down. So you could say, how far is it from three to 13? That would mean how much rise it went. How far is it from three to 13? Or if someone's three years old and someone's 13 years old, what's the difference? Oh, I just said it, 13 minus three over, that's the difference in y values, over difference in x values. So we did 13 minus three, so we have to do one minus negative four. See that? Difference in y's over difference in x's. Be sure to get the y on top. I've made the mistake that you do x minus x on top. That's wrong. Y minus y on top. 13 minus three, as we said, this time is 10. One minus negative four is one plus four, which is five. So the slope is two. Let's go straight to point slope form. Like we said, it's a great inroad. So let's create some space for us. And we have y minus equals x minus. We have a slope already. Slope goes here, two. Let's pick a point that it goes through. I like to use the positive ones. It makes life simpler for me. x minus one, y minus 13. Check. Let's move to slope intercept form by isolating y. In order to do that, we have to distribute the two. Got this equals two x, two times negative one minus two. There you go. And then isolating y, can you guess what we do? Yep, we add 13, add 13. Even if you didn't know, hopefully it makes sense now because it's the opposite of minus 13, it would be plus 13. Right. I wonder how many people were just had a light bulb like, oh, I finally, just in time. Okay, so 2x plus 11. Slope intercept form done. Standard. So standard form is a form in which x's and y's are all on the left side. And then any numbers left over, any constants like this 11 would be on the right side. Okay, so Let's, uh, let's box these so we know this is your point slope. This is your slope intercept. What would I do to both sides to get x's and y's on the left? I'm feeling subtract 2x on both sides. So I'm gonna just go ahead and do that. Let's say minus 2x here, minus 2x here, and that would go, and you would be left with negative 2x plus y. Notice x and then y. That's just a convention. It doesn't technically matter but standard asks that you put the x value first, equals 11. And this is kind of in flux, this is changing. Some purists say that the leading coefficient for x needs to be positive, all right? Some people are like, ah, whatever, it doesn't matter. But if you wanted to make that positive, you can multiply both sides by negative one if you wanna be super formal about it, standard form. So two x distributing negative minus y, equals negative 11. Notice it just changed all the signs and it's still bueno. It's still cool. There it is, standard form. All right, let's do more. Oh, okay, now we're talking about parallel lines and perpendicular lines. Okay, what is the equation of a line parallel to this and passing through this point? Talk to me about parallel. Can you think of parallel? You think of train tracks? If you knew that lines were parallel, you're invited to do this with your arms, you know, do this with pens or pencils or something, do this. Can you tell that the slopes are the same? So that would mean that our line, our answer, must have the same slope as this given line. What is the slope of this given line? Let's find out. By putting it into slope intercept form, isolating y, we'll be able to obtain the slope. 2y equals negative x plus 600. That 600 is there by design. I'm gonna tell you why I put that there. And then isolating y, divide two on both sides, and we get 
y equals. What is the slope? If you look closely, dividing these two would be negative one half x plus 300, 600 divided by two. So the slope of the given line is negative one half. So our line, if it's to be parallel, must have the same slope. So our line, let's put it down, our line would be y equals, for sure, negative one half x plus whatever our y-intercept is. We don't know what it is, so we'll put it here as b. This is not the y-intercept. You'll notice because x is not zero. The reason that this was 600 and now 300 is that the y-intercept of the given line is irrelevant. It doesn't matter. All that matters is that the slopes are the same. And now if we wanted to guarantee that our line crosses the point 2, negative 3, a rule for all lines, a rule for all graphs, is that any point that's on the line or on the graph can be successfully plugged in for x and y, right? If you know that this point will be on this graph, then they fit, they're substituted into x and y. So let's go ahead and set y to negative three. It's a rule for all graphs. And let's set x to two. And we get equals negative one half times two plus b. Now we could solve for b, see that? Let's do it, we get negative three equals negative one half times two is negative one plus b. And then moving it over here, it looks like if you add one to both sides, b will be negative two. Okay, and our equation of the line then would be right there. Let's put it down here. y equals negative one half x minus two. All right. We captured the slope, made the slope the same, inserted a point, solved for b, got it, and created the finishing equation. Now look, same data. Equation of the line perpendicular to this line and also passing through that point. Good news, we already know the slope. We already know the slope of this line, so we can even put that down. The slope of the given line, m equals negative one half. What does perpendicular mean? It means crossing at 90 degrees. If you cross two lines at 90 degrees in this little windmill here, right, something is true about the slopes. And the slopes for perpendicular lines, perpendicular is negative reciprocal. There's a whole proof as to why this is true. Negative reciprocal numbers are perpendicular slopes. Okay, one going in the positive direction, you could say, one going in the negative, one steep and one shallow. So what would the slope of our line be? Let's go back to our line. Our slope would be the negative reciprocal of negative one half. That would be positive and one half reciprocates to two. So now our line for sure is y equals two x plus b. See that? All we do is reciprocate and make this negative, and now for sure our line will be perpendicular. Let's do the same game where we plug in negative 3 for y and 2 for x. We go negative 3, 2 equals 2 times that plus b. So this becomes 4. Subtract 4 on both sides. That will be negative 7 equals b. And then the final equation there would be y equals positive 2x minus 7. Wow. Okay. See it all together right there? All right. Working. Let's go. Last two graphing ones for this particular chapter, because lines can be fun, funky, special. What would y equals 3 look like? Let's see if we can get a graph going. Mm, bop. All right. Where, oh, where in the world is y equal to three on this graph? Some students start with they know that it's up three. That's true. 
There's other places where y is 3. Not only here at 0, 3, but 1, 3. y is 3 there. y is 3 here. y is 3 all the way here, right? That would be like 10, 3 or 11, 3. Even way down here, negative something, 3. As long as y is 3, then y equals 3 is happy. Thus, y equals 3 is the equation of a horizontal line. y equals a number is the equation of a horizontal line always, right? And the slope in this case, rise over run, if you wanted to look at it, rise over run. The rise between any two points is zero. The run could be anything. You could go to the right five, you can go to the right one, whatever, over anything, you know, over, yay. Doesn't matter, would still be zero. Okay, so the slope of a horizontal line is always zero. If y equals a number is horizontal, da -da -da, da -da 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 -da. what do you think x equals negative two is? Where is x negative two? Here, negative two, zero, negative two, one, negative two, two, negative two, three. Yeah, there's something like kind of very fitting about how these two operate. x equals negative two is a vertical line x equals a number is always a vertical line, and the slope of this vertical line, rise over run. This case, do you see that there's no run? You're not moving x to y at all. So that would be over zero. The rise could be anything. It could be up 10, it could be down 10. So we'll just say that's anything, that's yay, any number. But if you divide by zero, it's undefined. So the slope is undefined for any vertical line. All right. Good job. Let's go to the next. Now we're talking about inequalities. Okay. The deal with inequalities. Here you guys see signs like less than, less than or equal to, and so forth. Often treat them like equations when solving for x. Isolate x using the same tools. In this case, we could add one to both sides, and we get 2x is less than 14. Divide by 2 on both sides, x is less than 7. That's cool. There is one caveat when dealing with inequalities. We'll talk about it now. Let's say add one to both sides, just like we did before. We get negative 2x is less than positive 14. And now if we divide both sides by negative 2, there's a fundamental rule. Whenever dealing with inequalities, if you multiply or divide both sides by a negative number, the direction of the inequality changes. Right? And we could prove this on a number line of what happens. We're not going to do that now, but just remember multiplication or division to both sides of an inequality, if that number is a negative, divide by a negative on both sides, multiply by a negative on both sides, this will change direction and it'll become x is greater than whatever 14 divided by negative 2 is, negative 7. Okay, keep that in mind when we go forward. Okay, possible values of x, then graphing. So this is called a compound inequality when you have two inequalities, let's say, in the same statement. So some students like to detach them and make them two statements. What's fun is that you could actually solve this all in one shot. If we're gonna isolate x, one thing we could do to all three sections is subtract one here, here, and here, gone. And what happens? We'll get two is less than one half x is less than or equal to seven minus one is six. X is still not by itself. What do we do to this? And all three would be to multiply by the reciprocal of one half, which would be two, multiply by two on all of them. And we get four is less than x is less than or equal to six and two, 12. So we can graph this on a number line. Here's that number line now, right? Simple number line will look like this. Put zero here. And x is greater than four, see that, meaning more than four, and less than or equal to 12. So in fact, I'm gonna just make a little pivot and put the zero here, right? Remember that math is creative. Math is creative. You can see it in your own vision. So here we have, let's say four, here we have 12. And x is somewhere between here. 
x can't actually be 4, it's more than 4. So if you have not or equal to, we do this open circle situation all the way through to 12. And si since x is less than or equal to 12, we do a closed, okay? So if you ever have or equal to, it's a closed circle. If you have not or equal to, open circle, okay? This is going to set us up for the next section. Do you remember absolute value equation? Bifurcate, all right? End that thing. <laughs> End it. 2x minus 1 equals 13. Or 2x minus 1 equals negative 13, right? 2x minus 1 can be the positive or negative version of this number, right? And let's do it again. So we add 1, add 1. Salad with dinner. Factory. Bang, bang. And we get 2x equals 14. x equals 7. 2x equals negative 12, x equals negative 6. Look, so we already did a, this problem before, which is why you saw me quickening the pace. It was a setup for what you're about to see. Oh, absolute value inequalities. Okay. These also entail bifurcation. Click. So is it safe to say that 2x minus 1 itself the quantity, the number, the guts inside the absolute value, that number can be less than 13. Let's say like 12, 11, 10, 9. 2x minus 1 can result in that. There's also negatives that it can be, right? So you could say 2x minus 1. A negative number that would work in here could be something like negative 10, right? Negative 10 would be cool because the absolute value of negative 10 would be positive 10, and that's less than 13. That's okay. But what's not cool would be like negative 18, because the absolute value of negative 18 is positive 18, and that's not less than 13. So we have to have a limit on 2x minus 1. I'm going to give you that limit now. 2x minus 1 has to be more than negative 13. Numbers more than negative 13 would be negative 12, negative 11, negative 10. And that would keep the inequality satisfied. So it's a bifurcation. You see that? And what's cool about this bifurcation is this first statement is a replica of the orig. And the second is a replica of the first statement, but the inequality flipped and the number changed. That's it. That's the process. Change the sign of this and change the 13 to a negative, And it should work out great. So now we're going to solve and graph. If you add one to both sides here, that's 2x is less than 14. Divide by 2, x is less than 7. Add one to both sides. This is 2x is greater than negative 1 plus 13, negative 12. Divide by 2, x is greater than negative 6. So are these both true or is one true? Let's take a look on our number line when we graph it. So we have this. Let's put zero here in the middle. All right, x is less than seven. Let's put seven here. Put this kind of in red. Seven, open circle, smaller. And let's go over here. Negative six, greater than open circle. So yeah see that both need to be true. Both need to be true, so we are going to put the word and in between. Okay, let's do this bifurcation. Look, it's the same exact beast, except instead of less than, it's greater than or equal to. Good news, the same bifurcation process exists, and I'll prove it to you. Here we go. First step is, pick a different color here, 2x minus 1, same statement, just bring it down, greater than or equal to 13. And then the second one, exact same as the first, except we change inequality and change the sign of the number. Watch, 2x minus 1, less than or equal to negative 13. So it's a beautiful process. It can carry you no matter the direction of the inequality. It's the same thing, replica of the first, Change, change.
Let's go ahead and solve. This is now 2x greater than or equal to 14, x greater than or equal to 7, 2x. It's all the same numbers if you think it through, right? Adding one to both sides, negative 12. x is less than or equal to negative 6. Now when we graph this action, what's going to happen? Here's 0. Let's again graph this one in red. Greater than or equal to 7 would be closed circle. Greater than means bigger, moving to the right. And then let's graph this one here with an orange. That would be less than or equal to negative 6. Or equal to means closed circle. Less than means smaller. Can both of these be true at the same time? Can you be more than 7 and less than negative 6 simultaneously? You can't. So the big word here is or. All right. Now, patent pending. Here's a little gift for you based on the sign. All right, if the absolute value inequality is less than, when I see less than, I think less than. Oh yeah, woo oh. <laughs> I'm getting loopy, are you? Okay, I can't work both times. This is greater, greater than. Great tour, it does work both times. That's my gift to you. No royalty needed. Onward. Let's do some absolute value inequalities again. Ooh, would I really give you more work to do? Bifurcate and everything? I don't think so. We've already done that. So let's talk about why I wouldn't do that. We've had previous discussions about absolute value resulting in a positive number. Can a positive ever be less than negative 13? No, no solution. Let's do it again. Can a positive number ever be more than negative 13? A better question is, is a positive number always greater than negative 13 or greater than a negative? Yes, no matter what. We talked about that absolute value can be positive or zero, right? So I'll just leave that as positive for now. How often is this true? Always, for all values of x. So then this would be all real numbers, all right? Whenever you have negatives with absolute value, raise the flag, raise the flag. Uh-oh, something suspicious, okay? And finally, we're gonna graph an inequality here. You'll notice it's in slope-intercept form. Okay, so we can actually do that same concept, slope-intercept. The y-intercept, the b value would be negative 3, 1, 2, 3 down. Slope is 2 or 2 over 1. So that would be rise of 2, run of 1, rise of 2, run of 1. And we, ah, here, this is what the inequality does. Since it's not or equal to 2x minus 3, the line itself isn't the actual solution. You dot the line whenever it's not or equal to. I had a student say, if it's or equal to, you pick up the pencil and draw the line, right? So if it's not or equal to, it's a dotted line. Now there's also more at hand. Do you agree Y is a measure of up and down? And if Y is a measure of up and down, do you agree greater than would be up? It's true. So if you have an inequality such as this and Y is greater than, that means this whole region above or higher than or more than the line is a uh, solution. So, and entails shading, right? And I like to ask students to do like creative shading, right? You have like a little tornado. Creative shading encouraged. Teachers, let your students have creative shading. It's fun. How about like stacks of bills? Yeah, we got cash money. There it is, not bad. This was my drawing of choice in seventh grade and on. So shading above the line, tornadoes and cash. Onward. Okay, systems of equations. Systems means two or more equations operating simultaneously. And the solution solving is where these two lines intersect. It's the point that works or is on both lines simultaneously. Let's go ahead and graph. We already know mx plus b, so we're happy about that. All right, where do we go? How about above? Let's do that. 
Do, 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 do. Yeah, become an old hand at this now. We're all learning, aren't we? Okay, so let's graph this one in red. 2x minus 1, down 1, y-intercept negative 1, slope of rise over run, up 2, right 1, up 2, right 1, up 2, right 1, down 2, left 1, down 2, left 1, down 2, left 1, and so forth. All right. I had one student say, you draw lines so straight, Mr. Adute. And I said, I went to line school. She's like, really? I'm like, no. <laughs> you got to be careful with your jokes. There is no line school. <laughs> Y-intercept is plus five. One, two, three, four, five, boom. And the slope is negative one over one. Down one, right one. Down one, right one, there it is. We found our solution. So the point of intersection where both lines intersect is two, three. So that is the answer to this problem. The answer to the problem is two, three. Good news, we're gonna solve it in different methods and hopefully get the same answer. Substitution method. The idea is you isolate one variable and insert that equation into the second, into the second. So I'm gonna increase the challenge here a bit and turn these into standard form, which is a way that you might see the problems given to you. So if I was to turn it into standard form, I'd bring the x's and y's on the left, subtract two x on both sides over here, that would be negative two x plus y equals negative one, sure. And that would be moved x's and y's to the left. That would be adding x to both sides. That would be x plus y equals five. So you'll be given usually, usually problems in this kind of standard form. So substitution method would mean let's get one variable alone. You could get any variable alone. You could pick one that's the most convenient. Perhaps this x, we can get this x by itself by subtracting y on both sides. All right, this is the process there. So we get x equals, call it five minus y. And if you look over here, there's an also an x. And so we can substitute what x is over there called five minus y. Let's do it. Negative two plus y equals negative one. Instead of x as promised, we'll write what x is. It's five minus y. Okay. And now we can solve for y. There we go. Negative 10 distributing plus 2y plus y equals negative 1. So you can maybe pause if you'd like and solve with me or solve yourself, however you want to do it. All right. I'd like to show you the process. That's my goal so that you know what each entail. And now add 10 to both sides. What I do? Mm. Plus 2y, that's 3y negative 10. Yes, this works. Add 10 to both sides. 3y equals 9. And then y equals 3. That's what we hoped for from our answer above. And if we put 3 here, we'll get x equals 5 minus 3. x equals 2. And once again, our solution, as we said before, was 2, 3. x is 2, y is 3, right? Which was right there. Now let's do it with the elimination method. Here we go. I'm going to write them in standard form. This time I'm going to stack them. All right, here we go. So we have negative two X plus Y equals negative one X plus Y equals five. Now we're permitted to add equations down. If you add equations down, that is mathematically acceptable. However, we want one of the variables to eliminate so that we can solve. Perhaps we can multiply. There's lots of different things we can do. I'm gonna show you one way. Let's multiply this equation by positive two to show you how one way to do it works. You could multiply by something else to get rid of the y's. Maybe you already see that you're gonna get rid of x here. So I'm gonna rewrite the first one. Negative two x plus y equals negative one. I'm gonna rewrite the second, distributing the two throughout. Two x plus two y equals two times five is 10. Now look what happens when we add down. Negative two x plus two x is gone. And we get three y add down equals nine. Oh, that sounds familiar. Y equals three. We already solved x equals two. And our answer is two, three yet again. 
So there you have it, all in one shot. Three methods of solving systems. The graphing method, finding the point of intersection, substitution method, and the elimination method. The final piece to this particular moment is discussing these two concepts, which are called no solution and infinite solutions. Let's talk about that. Let's pick it up on this idea of asking where these two lines intersect, or if they do, or how they do. That's what we're talking about. So we've already seen, for example, let's go over here, that two lines can intersect if they're straight at one singular point. That point of intersection is the solution. We've seen in this case that solution is two, three. Can you maybe get your body involved, or if you wanna pick up some pencils or markers or something, and just figure out how two lines can interact, right? What else can they do as I do this kind of weavy dance for you? How else can two lines interact besides crossing at one point? Maybe your mind goes to the fact that they can be parallel. And if lines are parallel, right, let's put it over here. The big question becomes, what is the point of intersection? That one and that one. You can see clearly if these lines are parallel, there is no point of intersection. And if there is no point of intersection, then that means there's no point that is simultaneously on both lines. So since they share no points in common, we would say that there's no solution to this system. If you graph them and they're parallel, then there's no solution. Another way that you could tell if there's no solution algebraically, whether by substitution or elimination, is that you would result in some sort of equation that makes no sense. That is, I would say, false always. An example of that would be, say for example, the algebra would say zero equals four. If you get something like this from just doing algebra, subtracting stuff to both sides, adding stuff to both sides, and solving for x, you would get something akin to that. This is so wrong, and when this happens, you would know it's a sign for no solution. How else can two lines interact besides one solution? And besides no solution, how else can two lines interact? Oh, maybe you're reading my mind. Whoa, if the lines are overlapping. Let's do that over here. And if the lines are overlapping, the fun question is, how many different points of intersections, intersection Different points of intersection exist. I'm getting my grammar right. Well, they intersect here and here and here and here and here and here and here, all the way through that line. And so the number of solutions that they share is infinite. So it's important to actually state, it's not enough to just leave the graph alone. You have to state infinite solutions, meaning there's infinite points of intersection, right? Let's be clear about this. This is no solution. So you have to say this, that's important. Can't just leave the graph alone. You have to cite no solution or do this empty set symbol. And infinite solutions would be the answer to this, infinite points of intersection. And then the example that you would get if you're working it algebraically, whether by substitution or elimination, you wanna get something that's forever false. You get something that's forever true. You would get something like x equals x, x equals x, excuse me or let's say six equals six, something like this that's, or zero equals zero for that matter, if you continue to subtract things from both sides, all right? So if you see something like that, that's a sign for infinite solutions. If you see a, an equation like that, that's false, that's no solution. Otherwise, it's gonna work out to this beautiful singular point. Right. Okay, that was systems, onward. All right, let's do a graph of inequalities. Remember, these entail shading. The only difference now will be, where is the region of overlap? We're gonna do that together. Here we go. Okay, two x minus one, y-intercept of negative one, slope of up to right one. Oh, this looks familiar. I remember this one. This was the same system from the previous page. Dotted or solid, or equal to means solid, throw it down. Okay, and shade up or shade down, y is greater than would mean shade up. I'm not gonna do that yet because I'm gonna wait for the friend and we'll find where it's gonna happen. 
So what I like to do sometimes is just do like a little note to myself, this little shade up thing. So I'm gonna come back to you later. So let's go ahead and do this one. Plus five, one, two, three, four, five is the Y intercept. Down one, right one. And go there and there, yeah, there's our solution. And now this time you could see it's not more equal to, so it'll be a dotted line. And this will be shade, which way? Y less than, shade down. So where is the only region that's up from red and down from blue? You see it? Up from red, down from blue is right here. And I'll aptly color it purple, primary color life. So that would be the solution region that makes both lines happy. Next, uh, we're on to exponents, friends. Okay, there are rules associated with this. If you don't know the rules, you're always encouraged to write it out. When in doubt, write it out. X to the fourth means X times X times X times X. X squared is X times X. And this will become X to the one, two, three, four, five, six. So in this format, you add the exponents, right? Air quotes, add. This is not an addition problem, but we do see that four plus two is six. This is a different story. In this case, squaring something, the thing that's being squared is x to the fourth. So that's x to the fourth times itself. And now we're at the same rule above. And so let's employ add rule. This would be x to the eighth. So when you raise a power to another power, we multiply those exponents. Very nice. Let's do this one here. X to the fifth, one, two, three, four, five, over X to the one, two, three. All right, multiply. X divided by itself is one and one and one. All these are ones. Leaving how many X's where? It leaves X squared, this time in the numerator. And we could use this subtract concept. Five minus three is two. So one could do the same thing here, but before I do that, I just wanna write it out to prove a point. This is one, two, three, this is one, two, three, four, five. All right, and if you notice, the three X pairs all go to one. I think of it as like a football line of scrimmage thing, offense, defense, they cancel each other out kind of. And we're left with, one over x squared. And if I insisted on subtract rule, wouldn't that be x to the three minus five, which is negative two. And if you look closely, that's a proof. For any negative exponent, the expression moves to the denominator. And the exponent becomes positive. Once again, if the exponent's negative, it moves downstairs and it becomes positive. We're gonna use that later. Let's do this one. Well, we do see it's x cubed divided by itself. Anything divided by itself is one. Or we could do that subtract rule. It would become x to the three minus three is zero. This is another proof. Anything to the zeroth power is the number one. x to the zero, y to the zero, apple to the zero, anything to the zero is one. All right. I like these types of problems. I call them side-by-sides, right? It's eight divided by 16 and X to the eight divided by X to the 16. So we're gonna take it piece by piece. Eight divided by 16 or eight sixteenths is one half. And then how many X's will cancel from the top and bottom? There will be eight of them that cancel, leaving eight in the denominator so this section would be x to the eighth. See that? So it's really forcing us to understand the difference between the numbers and the exponents. This is also a nice one. This is forcing us to know the difference between negative numbers and negative exponents. We said that negative exponents move to the denominator and become positive, but do negative numbers go to the denominator? No, there's no such rule, right? So this would be negative two, still in the numerator, if you wanna see it like that. And x to the negative third comes down, becomes x to the positive third. A common mistake is that people take the whole thing, they take the negative two and they put that down as well. That's not right. Only the negative exponent moves down and the exponent becomes positive. 
All right, onward. Oh, more exponents now. We're talking about scientific notation. A rule about scientific notation is that you have to have one digit and then the decimal place. So in this case, the one digit I'm seeing is the number two, right? So in this case, it would be 2.3. So clearly, 2.3 is way less than 2,300. So we have to increase this by a factor of 10. Every time you multiply by 10, this decimal place will move to the right and the number gets bigger and bigger and bigger. How many times are we moving 2.3 to get it to 2,300? Let's do one, two, three movements to the right. So this would be 2.3 times 10 to the positive third. Scientific notation again, same one digit, then decimal times. Now we have to make this smaller by factors of 10. And so if we're gonna move 2.3 to the left, right? That's technically dividing by 10, which would be times 10 to the negative two, all right? So in scientific notation, negative exponents make numbers smaller, moving the decimal to the left. Positive exponents make the numbers bigger, moving numbers to the right. Let's do this one. Okay, look, this is all multiplication, so it's not a distributive property game, right? It's not that at all. It's all times, everything times, times, times. So we could say three times four is 12 times 10 to the sixth times 10 to the negative 10th. This would be that add rule, okay? So it would be 10, six plus negative 10 is negative four. Some students leave this thinking it's done, but it's not because scientific notation demands that it's one decimal or one digit and then the decimal, right? So it's not the number 12, the answer needs to be 1.2 times 10 to the. If you make 12, smaller to 1.2 to balance it out, you have to make the negative four bigger by one place so that it balances, right? So smaller, 12 to 1.2, bigger so that the answer is correct, okay? Think of it like a balance. Think of it like a balance. Here we go. Exponents and radicals. So there is a very nifty rule that I'll show you right now that has to do with the denominators of exponents. It turns out that the denominators of exponents is also what's called the index of a radical. So this radical here would have an index of two, making that a square root. All right, there's a whole proof behind that. I'm not gonna do that now. So square roots kind of have a two hiding there the whole time, but it's an invisible two. So that would mean that it's the square root of 16. All right, and that would be four. Awesome, let's see if we can do that again. So the denominator of this exponent becomes the index of the radical. So in this case, it's a cube root of, in this case, eight squared. Or you could write it as, the cube root of eight squared. Either one is fine because this is an exponent by order of operations. It's a singular operation. So the order in which you do any of these radical operations would be the same. We'll prove it to you. The cube root of eight is two squared is four. And then this becomes the cube root of eight squared 64. What number times itself three times is 64? It's four. Boom. Let's do that once again. It looks like it's nicer to do this one to keep the numbers small. I'm gonna do that now. Here it comes. Square root of four over 25, all raised to the third. What times itself is four over 25? That would be two over five. 2 over 5 times 2 over 5 times 2 over 5 is 8 over 5 times 5 times 5. 25 times 5 is 125. Good. More. All right. We're doing a graph, exponential graph in this case. Let's do it up here. 
So you may have heard of things grow growing exponentially. So what you can do, think of it this way. Let's let x equal 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 3, and then negative 1 and negative 2, for example. When x is 0, that would be 2 to the 0, that would be 1. When x is 1, 2 to the 1 is 2, 2 to the 2 is 4, 2 to the 3 is 8, 2 to the negative 1 equals 1 over 2, that would be a half. Let's do it again. y equals 2 to the negative 2 equals 1 over 2 to the positive 2, which is 1 over 4. Right? And if you were to graph all these, you would see a very distinctive nature. 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 4, 3, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and then tailing off like this. It kind of looks like a plane taking off. That's how I see it. This is called exponential growth, all right? And if you look closely at that, the domain or all possible x values is that x could be any number in the world. You could plug anything you want in for x. And this graph goes left and right forever. And the range, all possible y values, see that y will never be down here. y will never touch this x-axis. So y will never be negative. y is greater than 0. And then the asymptote. Do you see asymptote is like this invisible line where the graph will never cross? And that will be this line right here. Earlier today, we talked about the equation of a horizontal line. The equation of that horizontal line is y equals 0. All right, so that's exponential growth. This one, on the other hand, would be 1 half to the x. So if you look closely, as x gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, 1 half times itself gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So what will happen is that you'll have not the plane taking off, but the plane landing. All right. If x is 0, y is 1. If x is 1, y is a half. If x is 2, 1 half times 1 half is 1 fourth. If x is 3, 1 half times 1 half times 1 half is 1 over 8. All right. In this case, when you have negative exponents, I'll do a, I'll do a simple one for you. 1 half to the negative 1, let's do that here, all right? If x is negative 1, all right, that's the same as, well, based on the rule that we said, it's 1 over 1 half to the positive 1, and 1 divided by a half is the same as 1 times the reciprocal, 2 over 1, and that would be positive 2. And there it is. And so this would be what I call plane landing, that. All right, domain, possible x values. x is still anything because it goes left and right forever. Range, y is still always going to be positive, right? y is always above the x-axis there. And asymptote is still this horizontal line at y equals 0. Okay. On to quadratics. These are some of my faves. A lot of it's distributive property. Let's go ahead and bang those out. Can we distribute x and 2? We're going to do that now. We'll distribute this x. x times x and then x times 4 is x squared plus x times 4 is 4x. And then we'll distribute the 2. Boom and boom. That would be plus 2x plus 8. Combine like terms, these two are like terms, 4x plus 2x, x squared plus 6x plus 8. Cool. This one, common mistake that our friends do, is that they square 3x and then square negative 2. That's incorrect. We have to write these as two sets of parentheses, 3x minus 2, 3x minus 2, and then we go ahead and distribute, and we'll see that we get 9x squared minus 6x, distributing negative 2 now, minus 6x, distributing negative 2 once again, plus 4. See that? I distributed the 3x to boom, boom, distributed negative 2 to boom, boom. All right, combine like terms, negative 6x minus 6x, negative 6 take away 6 is 
negative, further 12, boom. And then this one, same concept. We write it twice, so I'm just gonna kinda go like that. Ah, you know what, I'll do it, make it nice. So that's x plus a half times itself. All right, let's try it. x times x, x squared plus x times a half, one half x plus one half x. One half times one half is a quarter. And then these combine to two halves or one. x squared plus x plus a fourth. All right. Okay, so we're gonna graph these now. Let's do that. We'll do one over here. So like we said, plotting points is a great tool for lots of these graphs. We'll go over here. So let's plot some points. When x is all these different things, let's go 0, 1, 2, negative 1, negative 2. If we were to plug in 0 for x, y would be the result of that number. And that would be 0 squared is 0. And then 1 squared is 1. 2 squared is 4. Negative 1 squared is 1. And negative 2 squared is 4. If you graph these points, you'll notice a pattern. And it is your friend, the parabola. How you doing? You all right there? You OK? I know this is a lot of data. I wonder if you're gonna watch this in chunks, you know? Let's talk about it. Vertex, zero, zero. Axis of symmetry, the line that cuts it in half, right there. Axis of symmetry, this vertical line, this time is x equals zero, because x is always zero there. What else we have? Direction of opening is up. Right, direction of opening is up. The x-intercept is zero. The y-intercept is zero right there. The domain, it goes left and right forever. So x in this case is all reals. And the range, y is always positive or zero, right? It doesn't go down here. So y is greater than or equal to zero. And it has a minimum value right there at zero, zero. Okay. Let's do this next one. And I'd like to pick a different method. You'll notice this one, we plotted points and figured out what the parabola was doing, right? In terms of how the graph operates. Now we're going to plot points, but we're gonna use factoring as an insight into those points. The first step in all factoring problems is the greatest common factor. What is the greatest common factor of x squared and negative four x? We can undistribute from both of those. That would be x, so x coming out. All right, times what? x times what is x squared? That would be x. x times what is negative four x? That would be minus four. And the reason factoring is so beneficial is that if we set y to zero, if we set y to zero, the location on a graph where y is zero is the x-axis. Those are often called the roots or the zeros or the solutions or the x-intercepts. Often those are interchangeable. So what would x have to be so that y is zero? Well, each of these factors, the first factor is x, we could set that to zero. And then the next factor is x minus four, we could set that to zero, right? Either of those factors would have to result in zero so that y is, x equals zero is already one solution or x-intercept, add four to both sides, x equals four. So in other words, if I insisted on a table over here, here you go. When x equals zero, y equals zero. And when x equals four, y also equals zero. How does this play out graphically? Let's find out. Go over here, give me a graph and size it down a little. Okay, so I'm gonna graph those two points because it's fun. Zero, zero, four, zero, nice. So if you can envision a parabola with a positive leading coefficient, meaning it's going to open up, it's going to smile, that it would look akin to this. 
And so the vertex would have to be equidistant from both of these x-intercepts. So the vertex is somewhere between 0 and 4 x values, plus the vertex is at 2 something. I love the idea of 2 something because it cues our brain. 2 what, you ask? Well, when x is 2, what would y be? Let's see if I could slide it in. All right, it's electric. Slide. 2 squared is 4. I can't, yeah, I, I, I went there. Minus 4 times 2 is minus 8. So y would be negative 4. How about that? Boom. I plugged in 2 and for x and out popped negative 4 for y. So this is 2, negative 4. Rock. So there's a reasonable graph. Throw it down. Joop. And joop, right? Doesn't have to be a Picasso. Just be your best. Now we can do all the fun things. Axis of symmetry is this vertical line cutting it through. Da -da -da -da. AOS is x equals 2. We have x-intercepts. I'll write them down. 0, 0. And 4, 0, that also happens to be a y-intercept, right, at the origin called 0, 0. Domain and range, all right, domain is all possible x values. Is it fair to say that all parabolas that open up and all parabolas that open down extend left and right forever? And if they extend left and right forever, the x values can be anything, all real numbers. Algebraically, it's true here. You can plug anything you want here for x here and here, and guess what? Here. So I'm just going to mark the domain as all reals. More space. So x equals all real numbers. And the range, the range will not be all real numbers. Isn't that cool? A parabola that opens up has a minimum point. It won't go up and down forever. A parabola that opens down has a max point and will also not go up and down forever. It will go down, but it won't go up. So, in this case, we're going up forever. Our minimum value is this y value of negative 4. So y has to be greater than or equal to that minimum value of negative 4. This is a min, as we said. I think we covered them. Axis, direction, up. It went up, right? Smiling. It's a valley. X-intercept we did. Y-intercept domain range, min or max we did. All right, so as promised, we plotted points. We did factoring in order to find vertex. Now, let's try another method, okay? This method is a little, let's say, risky because it's formula-based, but I want to give you everything that I know that might help you, and it is the formula for the vertex. Do you agree if you were to get the vertex, you'd be able to graph from there? And so there is actually a way to conjure the vertex. Let's even write it. Create a little space for ourselves. La, 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 la. There we go. So the vertex, as you know, is a point. And that point, that ordered pair, is negative b over 2a, comma, something. This is the x value of the vertex. Admittedly, formulas are not my super favorite, right? Because it requires a form of memorization. But it's still true that negative b over 2a will give us the x value of the vertex. Let's cite what a, b, and c are. A, excuse me, A is the leading coefficient of x squared. A is 1. B is the coefficient for x. That's 6. And C is the constant here. I always like that. C for constant is 8. And so let's fly. Negative B would be negative 6 over 2 times A. 2 times 1 is 2. All right, so the vertex is definitely negative 6 divided by 2 is negative 3 something. The vertex is negative 3 something. So I like this method in the sense that it cuts straight, right? Trade-offs, pros and cons, okay? Pros and cons. If the vertex is negative 3 something, how do you suggest we get the something? What is the y value when x is negative 3? Much like we did over here. We're going to insert negative 3, 4x, and out will pop y. Roll with me, baby. Let's go. Negative 3 squared would be 9. Hook it up. Boom. Plus 6 times negative 3 is minus 18, plus the constant 8. 9 minus 18 is negative 9, plus 8 is negative 1. Bravo. 
we have our vertex at negative three, negative one. Graphing time. All right, we'll go over here. More space. Boop. Okay, very nice. How are we rolling? Negative three, one, two, three, down one. This parabola will open up. Okay. And from here, hmm, let's do another plotting of points that might be helpful using this concept of symmetry, right? What would be a convenient value to plug in for x? Oftentimes, that is zero. Zero. Let's try it. When x is zero, y would be zero squared, which is zero, plus six times zero is zero, plus eight. Zero, eight. Look at that. So that would mean one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Good. And guess what? We got the y-intercept. Let's mark it. It's right there. Y int is zero, eight. And now, if you're comfortable with this concept of symmetry, fun fact, can you feel that the parabola won't do that or that? Right? That would be non-symmetrical. So if we want this opposing point over here, we could ask ourselves, well, it looks like we went three to the right and then technically nine up to get here. So let's go three to the left and then nine up again. So three to the left, let's actually mark the point, it would help me. Three to the left would be negative six and then nine up again, nine plus the y value of negative one, or you could just count up, da -da 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 boom, we'll end up at eight again. And that's the giveaway for this concept of symmetry. It's pretty cool once you wrap your head around it. It's just like over and up. So let's see if I get that point right. Uh, yep, I think we're good. Ooh, multicolored parabola. Did not plan on that. Next is axis of symmetry, this vertical line. Let's see if I can draw that in conveniently for us. The equation of this vertical line, maybe you noticed by now, since it goes through the vertex always, it would be the same as the x value of the vertex. x equals negative three, vertical line. There it is. Let's do domain and range. Domain, we said left and right forever. Domain is x is all real numbers. Range, the minimum value for y is negative one. y is greater than or equal to negative one. It's a minimum value, there it is. And uh, x-intercept, ooh, okay. Looks like the x-intercept, I'm going to confirm graphically that we're hitting the x-intercept. And that would be, I'm feeling like it's negative four and negative two. Let's try it, negative four and negative two. Let's confirm, what would y have to be if you're on the x-axis? What would y have to be? Zero, let's do it. Mentally, negative four squared is 16 plus six times negative four. That would be minus 24. 16 minus 24 is negative eight plus eight is zero. Same with negative two, confirmed, let's do it. Negative two squared is four plus six times negative two is negative 12. Four minus 12 is negative eight plus eight would be zero again, okay. Beautiful, I think we got it all, min, max, axis of symmetry, direction of opening up, both intercepts, these are the x-intercepts, when y is zero, and uh, we're done with that. Okay, one more inventory in the whole thing. <laughs> wow. Okay, let's keep going. Quadratics, let's factor. All right, quadratics. Quadratics are as important to algebra as apple pie is to baking. You gotta get your apple pie game up as a baker. You gotta get your quadratics and factoring game up in algebra. The first step in factoring always is to look for the greatest common factor. I see one, do you see it? The greatest common factor of this trinomial is the number three. Let's do it, three comes out. Okay, three times what would be this trinomial? Three distributes to x squared. Then we get minus two x. Then we get minus 15. Three times negative 15, negative 45. Now we're talking trinomial factoring. So three is kind of along for the ride. We'll rock this, okay. 
So sometimes people call this concept FOIL, first, outer, inner, last. It's technically distributive property. We have to basically undistribute this trinomial so that it becomes in factored form. Factor to me is just pieces that multiply. Three times what times what becomes this original polynomial. Three times what times what? Well, if you know about distributive property, let's pick a fun color in here. What times what is x squared would be x. Now that we have x times x making x squared, we have to think of what these numbers would be. And it becomes a bit of a dance, right? It becomes what numbers through the distributive process would multiply to make negative 15 and also add to make negative 2. And it becomes a game. Think of it like a number game or a puzzle. What multiplies to negative 15 and adds to negative 2? Well, we're multiplying to a negative, so that would necessitate a positive and a negative number. And I always like to fixate on the multiply because if you think about multiply to 15, one real one comes out. That would be 5 and 3. Also, 15 and 1 is possible, but let's start with 5 and 3. And it turns out that 5 and 3 somehow, some way can add to negative 2. If one of them was negative, it would have to be negative 5 and 3. There it is. It's true. Negative 5 and 3 add to negative 2. I would invite you to redistribute this and confirm that x plus 3 times x minus 5 becomes x squared minus 2x minus 15 to make sure that you got it right. So this, at the end of the day, has three factors. Those factors are the number 3, x plus 3, and x minus 5. They multiply to make the original trinomial. Let's go over here. Ooh. Okay, again, we're looking for greatest common factor. I don't see one. So we're going straight to trinomial factoring. So look, there's so many different ways to do this, traditionally speaking. I'm going to do what maybe is kind of an old school way, because as good as you are, or as proficient as you are at a distributive property, that would lend itself to your factoring capability. So let's talk about distribution. What times what is 2x squared? Well, there's only one combination. That would be 2x and x. And again, we're going to play the same number dance, but with a little caveat. The caveat is, well, let's put, put the dance down. Multiply to negative 12 and add to positive 5. Careful, there are technically no numbers that themselves multiply to negative 12 and add to positive five, but it will work out through distribution, through the distributive property. So let's think of some numbers that multiply to negative 12. I'm thinking, let's say six, two, four, three, one, 12, for example. Now let's play, okay? Don't be afraid to play around. Really just let it in, Have, don't be afraid to experiment. If I did six, two, and I did a little distributive dance, we would see that 2x squared were cool. That's cool. We would get 4x and 6x and then 12. You see that 4x and 6x? Somehow, some way, can that add to 5x? It can't. So you could consider switching 2 and 6. There's other reasons why 2 and 6 won't work, right? I'll prove that to you now. See, there's a greatest common factor of 2 hiding in here. See that? But there's no greatest common factor of 2 here. So you can't have a magical greatest common factor appearing halfway through the problem. So immediately I know that that's out as well. Okay, so I'm just going to take that off. Goodbye. So we're out with 6, 2. Let's try 4, 3 for that same matter. And check it, friends. I know where 4 will not go. Do you agree? 4 can't go here because of the same reason. GCF hiding, but GCF is not present at all. So there can't be greatest common factors lurking magically from nowhere. I'm gonna take that four off and let's put the four here. Let's put the three. Let's do distribution again. Two X squared, we're cool. Then we get eight X. Then we get three X. Can these add or subtract some way to make positive five X? They can found it. Well, I want positive five X. So let's see if I can do this. That'll mean plus eight and minus three. A plus eight came from two X times four. So let's make that positive four. Oh, look at that, color coded. Bam, minus three X. And then confirming, 
negative 3 times positive 4 is positive or negative 12. And those two will add to make 5x. Awesome. So those are the factors. 2x minus 3, x minus 4. Okay, notice we have four terms now. When this happens, it's an invitation to, to do what's called factor by grouping. There's a process involved. I'm going to walk you through that now. Factor by grouping, think of them as two groups, let's say. If there were six terms here, sometimes happens in harder, harder versions, you'd split it into two groups again, three and three. In this case, let's go two groups. All right. Greatest common factor of the first group. What is it? Look at it closely. I see a number and I see variable. I'm feeling four comes out and x squared. Boom, boom. Times what? To make 24x cubed, that would be 6x. Times what to make 4x squared? That would be oh, plus one. Pretty cool. Let's do greatest common factor for the second group. Notice this is a negative, right? A little pro tip. The greatest common factor that you pull out of the second group will always match this sign. It's helpful to remember that. I think it's entirely necessary. Maybe, I don't actually know. But I would recommend doing it, right? I'm still learning, I'm still learning. So I'm gonna take out negative, GCF would be 10. Times what? We're going to get positive 6x, so it multiplies to negative 60x, and then positive 1. Exactly, negative 10 times 1 is negative 10. And look at that, look at that. Do you see? Oh wow, I missed greatest common factor of the whole thing. It's okay, hope is not lost. I could pull it out at the end, okay? Right, this is a dynamic experience, okay? We're working on it together. So do you see that 4x squared and negative 10 both multiply to 6x plus one? So they can group. Observe, 4x squared minus 10, both the 4x squared and the negative 10 both get 6x plus one. Look at that, the blue stuff combines and the red stuff combines. Some students wonder why it's not squared. I'm gonna address that now because of the two of these uh, 6x plus ones. The reason why is if you know about distributive property, do you agree it's 4x squared times boom, boom? If that's the case, that's right here, okay? And then do you agree after 4x squared, it's negative 10 times boom, boom, and that's here. So you only need one instance of 6x plus one. And let's fix my mistake. My mistake was not seeing a greatest common factor at the beginning. It's so important that it's good to have this moment. What is the greatest common factor of 4x squared minus 10? And it would be two, confirming two is the greatest common factor of the whole polynomial. Lovely. Bloop. Okay, come on out, bop, bop. 2x squared, minus five, honor the color, bring it, la, 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 6x plus one. All right, four, two, three, <laughs> three factors. Boom, boom, and boom. These three multiply to make this extended polynomial. Okay, let's keep going. More, more factoring. Okay, so you could see on the previous page, we did trinomials. The prefix tri means three. That has its own factoring game. We also saw four terms. Now we see a binomial, prefix bi means two, and this is a specific name. It's called a difference of perfect squares. Difference of squares. X squared is a perfect square, and nine is a perfect square. Difference means minus between. Difference of squares. So would it interest you to know that this factors, what times itself is X squared? X. What times itself is nine? Three, in fact, multiply to negative nine would be plus and minus. If you were to distribute these, you would see that the negative three X and the positive three X on the line essentially cancel each other out. There's no X term leaving just the negative nine after. Difference of perfect squares. Difference of perfect squares. Is nine X squared a perfect square? <laughs> Get excited. <laughs> Yes, is 25y squared a perfect square? Yes, difference between. Note, if it was plus, 
it doesn't factor. Must be a minus between, very important. If something doesn't factor, we call that prime, like the number 17. The only factors are one and itself. Okay, let's rock it. Boom, 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 boom. Same question, multiplies to nine x squared. What times itself? It's three x. What times itself is 25y squared? That'd be five y. And then opposing signs, we could do minus plus. It doesn't matter the order of those signs. And that would be fully factored. Ooh, now we have factor and solve. Okay, so we did this earlier today with the graphing one where we we're solving for the x-intercepts. If you recall, when you're graphing, this little zero is in place of the y, right? So now if it were to be graphed, that y would be the zero value. Essentially, we're solving for x-intercepts when it says solve, right? When this y value would be zero. But we're talking algebra, we're not doing the graph right now. And I spy yet another difference of perfect squares. La la. Did you see a greatest common factor between these two? I don't either, All right? So we continue on. Multiplies to 16 x squared times itself is four x. One is a perfect square, what times, what times itself? One, well, that was very loud. <laughs> one and one. Echo in the studio, plus and minus. All right, in order to solve, if factors multiply to make zero, either of the factors can result in zero. So we set each factor to zero. 4x plus one equals zero. And then 4x minus one equals zero. Some people that like to write them side by side first and then solve down, my prediction about you is like, you like to have salad with dinner. You like it all at once. And the people that just like to do four X plus one equals zero and solve, you like salad before dinner. True or false? Think about it. <laughs> Making predictions. Add one to both sides, or excuse me, subtract equals negative one. And X will equal negative one fourth. That's one solution. All right, salad with dinner, right? We're doing it all at once, everything on the table. 4x equals 1 and x equals 1 fourth. So there are two solutions there. And now, hmm, okay. We could do potentially trinomial factoring yet again. We would have to set this equal to zero by subtracting seven and see if it factors. I wanna introduce you to a different way called the square root property, okay? I'm noticing that this factors, right? And uh, let's just jump into that because setting it equal to zero is something we've already done, right? Setting all factors to zero. So I'm gonna mix it up for you. Okay. What is the factorization of x squared plus 12x plus 36? I'm feeling what? It's x times x, multiply to 36, add to 12, multiply to positive 36, add to 12, None other than positive six, positive six, and look at that, they are the same. So if you're comfortable, I'm going to write it as x plus six. The quantity squared equals seven. And now we can solve using the square root of both sides. Take the square root of both sides to reverse the squared, leaving just x plus six equals. Whenever we take the square root of both sides of an equation, it requires us to account for positive and negative numbers that can multiply together. Positive and negative numbers that can multiply to let's say make seven. So square root of seven times itself is seven and the negative version. In short, whenever taking the square root of both sides of an equation, must write plus or minus. Cool. We are one step away from getting X by itself. And that would necessitate subtract six on both sides. La la, here we go. And that's gone, x equals, these are non-like terms, they don't combine in any way. So we can write it as negative six plus or minus the square root of seven. And this is a giveaway that in fact, this would not factor traditionally by setting it equal to zero by subtracting seven because we get an irrational answer. The two numbers, the two answers are negative six plus root seven, and negative six minus root seven. Two solutions for this particular quadratic equation. Onward and upward. 
Mm. Ooh, okay, we're moving away from factoring, which was apple pie. What do you think of this, like, banana cream, right? Not as important, but still very creamy. Uh, well, completing the square. The reason why completing the square exists, and even quadratic formula, is that sometimes trinomials don't factor. So we are going to walk through the completing the square process, right? You can see that there's no numbers that multiply to one and add to six. That one is the culprit. So bye-bye one, you're a fly in our pie. Minus one, minus one. Gown, leaving, x squared. Let's make some space for us over here. x squared plus, yeah, let's explore the space. Plus six x, leave a blank equals negative one, right? That C value was bothering us. So come up with your mind, with your mind, in your mind, what this would be so that this trinomial would factor and not only factor, but the same factor twice, okay? You could do that. It adds to six, that's the hint, and it multiplies to something, and it has to be the same thing twice. If it's the same thing twice, let's go ahead and do this. Dee, 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 dee. X and X, we know, right? It has to be the same thing that adds to six. Ooh, I know the same thing that adds to six. Threes. So that would work. And those would multiply to make nine. That's right, they do multiply to make nine. So we really wish that nine were here. We have the liberty to add whatever we want to both sides. So I'm gonna do it, plus nine over here, plus nine over here. Look at that, now it factors to x plus three times itself equals what happens to be negative one plus nine is eight. Again, with your permission, I'm gonna write this in squared form. And we're gonna do what we did previously. We are going to take the square to both sides. Do you recall what symbols you need to do whenever taking the square to both sides? Plus or minus, x plus three equals plus or minus. The square root of eight does simplify. We're gonna talk about that later. It's not a perfect square. So the numbers that multiply to make eight, one of them would be a perfect square, is the number four. So you could think of this as root four times root two let's say. In fact, I'm going to just maybe dance it over here. Root 8 is root 4 times root 2. Square root of 4 is 2, leaves 2 root 2. See that? So that's 2 root 2. Isolate x in one step by subtracting 3 to both sides, resulting in x equals negative 3 plus or minus 2 times the square root of 2. These are our answers. Plural, right? There's two answers here. Maybe you've noticed by now it's the same problem. I did this intentionally because I want to make sure we get the same thing with a different method. Multiple paths to the mountaintop, both in math and in life. Roll with me, baby. All right, so the quadratic formula is a fancy formula. I'm going to write it over here. X equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a, right? If you ever need help remembering this, remember there's a story about the negative boy who couldn't decide yes or no to go to a radical party. But the boy was a square, so he missed out on four awesome chicks. And the party was all over, get it, at 2 a.m. Wow. Four awesome chicks. That's a lot. You know, maybe you should just get one and be lucky, right? You should have gone to that party. Could have met your soulmate. Okay, let's identify A, B, and C. A is one, leading coefficient. B is six. And C is the constant one. And we throw them down. Here we go x equals negative 6, right? I'm just taking these values and inserting them in. It's a little cumbersome, but it works for all quadratics. This formula will work. Plus or minus the square root of b squared is 6 squared is 36 minus 4 
times a times c would be minus four times one times one is minus four, all over two times one is two. Onward, x equals negative six plus or minus the square root of 36 minus four is 32, all over two. x equals square root of 32. 32 is not a perfect square, so we're gonna do this simplification technique where we find perfect squares lurking inside 32 that multiply to 32, factor of 32. And I know a big one, often students say four and eight. You're not wrong, but let's do a bigger one. A bigger one would be 16 and two. I want orange, there we go. Root 16 times root two, and that will become four times the square root of two. So we'll put that down, negative six plus or minus all over two, just to make it pop, this is four root two. Two divides into all terms above. So negative six divided by two, x equals negative three plus or minus four root two divided by two, right? These coefficients, the coefficient would divide. Four divided by two is two root two. Click, and that's always satisfying to know that you get it no matter what the method, right? There's beauty in that, there's peace in that. And maybe if you're taking a test and you're tested on different ways, if you have the time, you can experiment with different ways and verify that you get the same answer. And if you don't, then it's a flag to know to do something different. Okay, test taking strategies. Oh, next we have graphing functions. And we have what are called transformations. Transformations, much like the word, means changes, changes to the graphs. In this case, you could see y equals x squared, the one we're playing with is a parabola quadratic, in this case, y equals x squared looking like this. The good news about transformations, and these are the main transformations or changes to the graph, those transformations are true no matter what type of graph we're working with. So parabolas would have all these transformations or a square root graph or even lines. Any graph that has these types of operations baked into the equations will have the same changes to those graphs. What are those changes? Let's do a rundown, all right? I like the idea of the parabola because we can really see it and we've talked about it before. So I'm just gonna pull up these graphs on Desmos over here and we have them teed up for you. Click. All right, so let's get our parabola going. It's right here. Y equals X squared and there it is. Notice vertex at zero, zero, move it there. Any guess what y equals x squared plus three would look like visually when you put plus three after? I'll give you a hint. It's either up or down or left or right. All right, any guess? All right, let's see if your guess is true. Ah, look at that. Plus three implies up. So that is called a translation, right? A type of transformation. It's a shift up, vertical shift up. So you can imagine plus four would be four up, or plus 10 would be 10 up, and minus 10 after the fact would be 10 down, all right? So after the x squared, after the action with x, I call it, that would be a vertical shift or a vertical translation. All right, we'll take that off. Now look, do you see that x minus two squared, this negative two, is now in x's house. And if you're in x's house, you must not be affecting uppy downy, you must be affecting left to right, as the car agrees with me nearby. You're affecting left to right, so I'll leave it to you. Would that be right two or left two, x minus two squared? So if you have a guess, let's see how close you are. Is it right or left two? Wow, look at that, huh? It's right two. It has this opposite effect, isn't that interesting? Oftentimes, many students, understandably, think that minus two would be a left shift, but it's actually a right shift, right? And the way that I help, it helps me understand why that is, is that if y is something squared, y is some amount squared, the smallest value that y can be, if you're, it's the result of squaring something, the smallest thing y could be is zero. So it has to, you have to ask yourself, what would be the value of x to allow y to be zero? 
and that value of x would be 2 because 2 minus 2 is 0 squared is still 0. So in a sense, x has to overcompensate and become positive 2 to counter for the minus 2. That's why it moves 2 to the right. Often I like to say that the vertical shift is the, the kind of the old school. In my day, plus 3 meant up. You know, your word is your bond, right? Plus 3 means up, logically. And then the minus 2 is like, you know, the new age counterculture, you know? Like, hey man, minus 2? Oh, you mean right because we like to mix it up in here. So think opposite inside with the X and think literal for the vertical shift with Y. All right, and the two of them should have lunch. What do you think both of these would entail? Ooh, opposite, minus two would be right two. And then minus four after, would that be up or down? It would be down, it's the literal one. So let's look at that. We're looking at right two, right two, and down four, there it is. Vertex at two, negative four. Okay, couple left. What do you think a minus in front of the x squared does? If y is the result of something squared in this case, negative that would mean y is negative. Where is y negative? We're thinking down. So that's why when we throw a negative in front of the action with x, we call that a reflection over the x-axis, all right? Anytime you have a negative out in front, reflection over the x-axis. Now one more. We have leading coefficient two or any leading coefficient out here, let's say. It won't affect the vertex. You could see here, x is zero, y is zero. So this, in this case, shows you that y would be growing faster. y is two times what it was before. Observe, see that? So we, that is literally called vertical stretch. I like to use the body to, to exemplify that, vertical stretch, right? If that's a number more than one, y is growing. And if that's, let's say, a fraction less than one, then it would be vertical compress. Y wouldn't be growing as fast. It would have this outward feel, okay? But either way, that's some sort of a vertical stretch or compression, okay? Great. So let's... Put the, let's go back to our old friend here and jot those down for you so you have them all in one spot. Here we go. So that's the original one. This one here would be up three. This one here is right two, vertical or horizontal translation or horizontal shift. This one is right two, down four. This one, reflection, reflect over x-axis. And this, since the leading coefficient is more than one, y is growing more rapidly, vertical. Oh, it feels nice. Stretch. Yeah, you're invited to stretch too while I write this. Take a stretch break. Vertical. I mean it. Self-care. You doing it? Trusting that you're doing it. Let's continue. Boom, start the play button and go. All right, so we're gonna graph. Now, I've noticed over the years that this function called the step graph or the least integer function, it's kind of like on its way out. That's just what I've noticed personally, but I'm still gonna give it its love. The idea is think of this as a machine. No matter what number you put in for X, it will always round down to the closest integer. It won't round up, it'll always go down. So you could say, concept of that is, if x is zero, sure, y would be zero. If x is, let's say, a half, y is zero. If x is even a quarter, like let's go three-fourths, y is zero, even 0 0.9, nine-tenths, y is zero. And then the second you get to one, then it will be one. And then same concept. How that looks visually is as so. Do I have one? Oh, yeah, it's still here, yay! So check it out, this is how it looks. Let me get some more space here. There, okay. So it's like this, up and a hole, right? So all the way up to, but not including one. And then you throw another point here. Kind of looks like little minnows. It'll do that as well. See that? That's how it looks. 
how it manifests out, right? So even if you're at 1.99, it would still round down to one, and that's where you get that point, right there, right there. Okay, so that's called the step function or least integer function. Let's do absolute value, okay? Absolute value right here. I like to call it absolute value, and that always makes my ears vibrate. Why value? You'll see in a second. Let's draw it when x is zero, absolute value of zero is zero. When x is one, y is one, when x is two, y is two. When x is negative one, y would be positive one, negative two, positive two. And when you get a graph going for that, for that, click, very nice. You will see a very distinctive shape, friends. Here, one, one, two, two, three, three, and on. Negative one, one, negative two, two. Get it? Absolute v value. It looks like a v. Absolute value graphs. Those transformations we did previously would all apply here. Up, down, left, right. Reflection, stretch. It would all apply to this as well. Do we have anything to mention? Okay, no mention of domain and range. So that's good. We're good on the graph there. Let's go here. These are called piecewise functions. Piece like pieces and you're treating them like in separate different buckets, piecewise, or, you know, piecewise, even though that's not how it's called, it's this, piecewise. All right, let's talk about these different pieces. Y equals two is the first graph. Y equals two is a horizontal line, if you recall from earlier. And we're gonna graph that in red. Let's go y equals two. I'm gonna do this one time and then you'll see that I'm gonna change it. So here is y equals two. However, we have a restriction on the domain. X has to be less than negative three. So where on the line is X negative three or less? Right there. So essentially we have to keep the parts where X is less than negative three and remove the parts where x is more than negative three. Often eraser helps. So I'll just do that. De -de -de, erase, erase. And another thing we'll notice is that x is not allowed to be negative three. It has to be less than only. So we do that with this little open circle, sometimes called a hole. There it is. So that's the first part. Next one in blue. We're graphing the line y equals negative two x. It looks like this is in slope intercept form. The y intercept is zero, slope negative two. Right, we could do negative two over one, if that helps us. So I'm gonna do that same erase technique, down two over one, down two over one, up two left, up two left, right? And I'm just gonna get that going. All right, not looking for perfection, there it is. And we want those X values that are between negative three, inclusive of negative three this time, and one, less than one, non-inclusive. So it helps to just consult the graph. Where is x negative three? Huh? Uh, there. And that's gonna be a closed circle. Through to x equals one, but less than one. Da, 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 there, where we have open there. All right, so let's get out our eraser. There's that. I'll come back and do a little open better. There it is. All right, so the eraser is kind of nice. There you go. So that's the value or the graph of y equals negative two x for x sandwiched between negative three and one, not inclusive of one. So now that we've successfully graphed the second piece, there's that, let's go ahead and graph the third, y equals x plus one, also in slope intercept form. And we have a domain restriction, x must be greater than or equal to one. So that's a little sign that we need to do a closed circle. This time I'm gonna challenge myself to graph the line and the restriction at the same time. So I know that the y-intercept is one. Let's say I start there. Slope is one. So that would be up one, right one. And lo and behold, right there, that's when x is one. Up one, right one, up one, right one. I want all these ones that are big x's moving to the right. So we have that going up and we graph this line. So that is the piecewise graph of three separate lines in this case with various restrictions on the domain. And that would be the graph that represents them. All right, let's go to the next.
Onward to square roots, starting with graphing and then working on how they operate, simplifying, exploring some properties. We're gonna do that. It's definitely helpful to start with the graph so we can visualize what's going on with the graph of y equals the square root of x. So let's create a little real estate for us. And a little here. All right, y equals the square root of x. A great place to start often, if we can, is setting x to zero. So if x was zero, y would be the square root of zero, which is zero. Let's try one. y equals the square root of one. The square root of one is one. Now we could continue going two and three and so forth, but you'll notice the square root of two, not super fun. We'd probably need a calculator to evaluate the square root of two because two is not a perfect square. So we could take liberties as math students and think about what values for x we can plop in there to make our lives a little easier. And I'm thinking of perfect squares, the square root of something that evaluates nicely. Another perfect square would be the number four. So square root of four, y would be the square root of four is two. What's the next perfect square after zero, one, and four? Something times itself would result in nine. The square root of nine is three. Let's graph those points, see what happens. Okay, da 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 da, zero, zero. One, one, four, two, five, six, seven, eight, nine, three. And look at that, there it is. Okay, it's sort of like half of a parabola on its side. That's how I see it. And you could see as well that we have not talked about negatives. There is a reason for that because it's impossible to have a negative number inside a square root. That would mean what times itself is negative. There's no number times itself that's negative. So any number under the square root can't be negative. All right. So that would, that's the clue for the domain. Once again, definition of domain, all possible X values. What are all possible X values? If this graph begins at zero, zero and moves to the right, the domain would be X is greater than or equal to zero. And what are our possible y values, the range, if this graph begins at zero, zero, and moves up, right? Y is an uppy downy measurement. And it's like, <laughs> how do you feel? Well, so, so. In this case, up. I feel up. So the range is y is greater than or equal to zero. Okay. Now we're going to do this graph. You may recall from a little previous to now that we have transformations. X plus three has a variation or transformation in terms of x to either left or right, then minus two would be an up and down. You recall what those are? As well as a negative out front, right? Feeling reflection. So we're taking the exact same graph, y equals the square root of x, and we're shifting it around. So why don't we do that straight up graphically, right? I won't do the table this time. So instead of zero, zero, let's talk about it. Plus three is left three movements. Minus two is down two movements. Left three, down two would start at negative three, two. Lovely. Okay. And normally you would have this up one, right one, up two, right four effect. You would normally have those, right? There's no change to its verticality, except for the fact that you have a negative down here. Right. If that was too much, if that was too intense, that I'm going to kind of grab these points and import them over here in that same sort of landscape, you could also plot, you know, you could also do that. And that would also give you that reflection. So it's going to go like this down and to the right. Okay. I'll prove it to you. So we already have negative three, negative two. Let's go one to the right. That would be negative two. Roll with me. Negative two plus three is one. The square root of one is one. Make that negative is negative one. Minus two is negative three. All right, let's get a little more space for us. There it is. Another value that we could throw down. Hmm, I don't like zero. Uh, how about one, right? I'm looking for perfect squares, right? What is one plus three? One plus three is four. Square root of four is two. Make it negative, bang. Negative two minus two, be negative four. Throw it down and you could see one, negative four. See, it's already doing that, okay? 
So it would have gone up like this had there been no negative, but we're going down ski. Okay, that's fine with me. We have our starting value at negative three, negative two, and that's an insight into the domain and the range. So the domizzle is x is greater than or equal to negative three because we're moving to the right. And the range is y, talk up or down. Down, less than or equal to starting value of negative two. All right, cool. So that transformation has actually helped us in that case. Onward and upward. Da -da -da. Let's review how square roots operate. Okay. What is x plus x? 2x. That's right. What is banana plus banana? 2 banana. What is anything plus itself? 2 of that thing. So root 3 plus root 3 is 2 root 3. It's not root 6, okay? It's not root 6 because we're grouping things. This is combining like terms. So root 3 plus another root 3. Some people like to see this. 1 root 3 plus 1 root 3 is 2 root 3. Now we're talking root 3 times root 3. Well, if you don't know exactly what that answer is, you can say that it's the square root of 9 because radicals do combine with multiply. Radicals do combine with divide. You can mix and match them with multiply and divide. But what is the square root of 9? What times itself is 9? 3. So root 3 times root 3 is 3. What's root 5 times root 5? 5. What's root 6 times root 6? Six? 6. What's any root times itself? Root banana times root banana. Is the number inside is banana. All right, potassium day. However, are we allowed to mix and match, combine and detach radicals with plus, let's say, or minus. Here comes a little bit of a proof. So nine plus 16 inside the radical would be 25 in there, Let's switch the color, right? So that would be the square root of 25. Square root of 25 is five. All right, let's see, question mark. Oh, we already have question mark, cool. Curiosity, let's say equals square root of nine. See, we split it, click. We split it over the radical, see if that's possible. Three, square root of nine, square root of 16 is four. 3 plus 4 is 7. Not the same. So we may not break apart radicals over a plus or minus sign. We may break apart and combine with multiply or divide. Keep that in mind. We're going to do that now. All right. It's one of my favorite parts, right? It's kind of fun, snappy. What times itself? The square root of 16. What times itself is 16? 4. What times itself is 18? Ooh, there is no number times itself that's 18. It's not a perfect square. So let's break apart the 18, like we said, with multiply, in which one of those numbers is a perfect square. And that will be able to evaluate that square root. So some people, they like to say, ooh, I got it. Root six times root three. This is mathematically true. However, is six a perfect square? No. Is three a perfect square? No, so we have to try again. What times what makes 18 and which one of them is a perfect square? Maybe you're thinking nine and two. Root nine times root two. The square root of nine is three. So this becomes three root two, right? The root two remains. Awesome. What times itself is x squared? x, x times itself is x squared, all right? And for those people that are the purists, you would have to know right, that the square root of a number must result in a positive. This can never be a negative six or something. So since that's the case, we have to put this in an absolute value, right? We're going to talk more about that a little, a little later, okay? So the square root of x squared is x, and we force it to be positive or zero with absolute value. What times itself is x to the fourth? You can even put it down, put it over here. What times itself? is x to the fourth. You may know it. It is x squared times itself. Lovely. So that's true. I'm going to put down x squared. Now, if x were negative by chance, would x squared result in a negative number? It wouldn't because a squared will always be positive. So in other words, no need for absolute value if the result has 
an even exponent, right? I know this is a lot of data, it's like fire hydrant style. So you could slow down, pause, take a break whenever you need, right? The square root, the result of a square root has to be positive or zero. It can't be negative. X squared won't be negative, so we're cool. We have no worries. Let's ask the same question. What times itself is X to the sixth? Th <laughs> what times itself is X to the sixth? Huh, what do you think? Is X to the sixth a perfect square? It is. I'll show you, it's X to the third, X cubed. As proof of that, X cubed is X times X times X. X cubed again, X times X times X. And look at that, that's X times itself six times. So that result in X cubed. A reminder again, this result of a square root can't be negative. An odd power runs the risk of being negative. So we force absolute value yet again. Let's talk about, la 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 la, oh, X to the seventh. Is X to the seventh a perfect square? Something times itself, not feeling it. So we're gonna do the same break technique. What's hiding inside X to the seventh that multiplies X to the seventh is a perfect square. If you're saying, x to the fourth times x cubed, you're not wrong because x to the fourth is a perfect square. And x to the fourth times x to the third is x to the seventh. I'm gonna challenge you though, what's the biggest entity or the biggest factor that multiplies to make x to the seventh? And here's a hint, we just did it. That is a perfect square. La 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 la. You see it already on the board? Look at that. Isn't it true that x to the sixth times x is x to the seventh? Yes. The square root of x to the sixth does evaluate cleanly. x to the sixth is a perfect square. So we could throw it down. Absolute value of x cubed times square root of x. Look at that. Okay. The perfect squares hiding inside exponents would be the closest even one. Right? Pro tip. Maybe you've seen that by now. Back to numbers, friends. Remember that we said that we are allowed to break apart and reattach square roots over divide. Right? And there is this rule right in the land of algebra that requires us to not have radicals or irrational numbers in the denominator. Right? It's not simplified when that's the case. So we're gonna to have to simplify it in this method. Perhaps we can multiply top and bottom by the same thing, and that would resolve this square root. So what can we multiply the square root of two by so that there's no more square root? It would be itself. And since we multiply the denominator by square root of two, multiply the numerator by square root of two. The square root of two divided by itself is technically one. If you multiply by one, you're within your rights. Totally allowed, we're not changing any values. And now we can multiply across. Root five times root two is root 10 over any root times itself is the number underneath. And there we go, root 10 divided by two. What do we now multiply numerator and denominator of this by to resolve the fact that there is a square root in the bottom? The technical term for that is rationalize the denominator. Make the denominator go from irrational square roots to rational non-square roots. Some people think that it's root two again. It won't be, because if you distribute root two to four plus root two, it will remain another radical down there. So the thing to multiply four plus root two by is what I like to call the evil twin, four minus root two. All right. So they're kind of twins, but one's positive, one's negative. And these are technically called conjugates, right? When you have binomials like this, two terms. It's fascinating to actually see, even to this day, after so many years, that this actually multiplies through and becomes no more radicals. That is grammatically incorrect, but it doesn't matter. We're doing math. Two distributes, here we go. Two times four is eight. Two times negative root two is minus two root two. Okay, numerator, cool divided by. Let's distribute four times four is 16. Four times negative two, 
minus four root two. Root two times four, positive plus four root two. And then root two times negative root two, we call it root times itself, is the number inside. There we go, there it is. So that'll be minus two. All right, negative four root two plus four root two goes to zero, bye. So we have eight minus two root two, little tradition at home with our kids. They're like, bye. So I just did it now, showing you the love. I notice factors. All right, we have a factor of two that could come out of all three terms. If you factored two out, it would divide with 14, but you know, we're in the mode now. So let's divide all these by two. This is four, divide this, this is one, divide this, this is seven. And we have four minus the square root of two all over seven. Or some teachers prefer that you divide into both. You could say four sevenths minus root two over seven as well. Take a breath. Onward, let's go. Okay, let's try this page. Simplify the following square root expressions. Here we go. These are non-like terms. Perhaps we could simplify the square root of 20. I'm feeling that, so let's leave it as six root five minus two times root 20. What's the perfect square hiding inside 20? Because 20 is not a perfect square. Uh, four and five, root four, root five. Okay, that's that root 20 right there. All right, square root of four is two times two is four. Cool, let's do it. So that would be six root five minus two times two is four root five. And now they are like terms, fun. Six root five minus four root five leaves two root five. Throw it down. What else we got? Ooh, multiply. Remember, we are permitted to combine radicals or detach them with multiply. So in this case, we have three times four, that makes 12. Root two times root six, root 12, coincidentally. 12 is not a perfect square. What's hiding inside 12 that is? All right, let me give you a chance to think it through. Root four, root three. I know I didn't give you much of a chance. I tried to give you a beat, okay? Square root of four is two times 12 is 24. 24 root three, there's that one. All right, the reason why this is on the board is to demonstrate what not to do. It's not two squared and then not negative three, a negative root three squared, okay? This is a binomial. The whole quantity, this whole piece is being squared. Squared means times itself. So I would recommend actually writing it twice and then it might pop about what we do. See that? We've seen this earlier. Distributive property. Okay, here we go, rocking it out. Two times two is four minus two root three, minus two root three again. All right, and then negative root three times negative root three would be plus root three times itself is three. Okay, we combine like terms and we're going to get four plus three is seven, negative two root three minus two root three minus four root three. So again, write them out twice. It's gonna cue, cue your brain about what to do. All right, onward, let's go these. Ooh, solving square root equations. What can we do to both sides to remove the square root? Can you guess? It's the opposite of square root. The opposite of square root is to square it. So I'm going to square both sides. What ends up happening is any root times itself is the number inside, the stuff inside, leaving x plus five equals three squared is nine. And look at that, subtract five on both sides. We get x equals four. Please note that whenever we square both sides with these radical operations, we might create new answers that actually don't work. So it's incumbent upon us to check our work to see if we have what are called extraneous solutions, solutions that may need to be thrown away. Let's try it. Does four work? The square root of four plus five, four plus five inside is nine. So I'll be the square root of nine 
Does that equal three? It does, we are good. So x equals four is the solution. Let's do it yet again. Mm -hmm. Real estate. All right, let's go over here, friend. That's good. Oh, I got toys. So again, we want to resolve the fact that there's a square root here. So again, we're gonna square, or excuse me, square both sides. But you may notice, again, we have a binomial squared, just like we did up here. Binomial squared, we should write it twice. Okay, cooking. This becomes x plus five equals x plus three times itself. This becomes x plus five equals x squared plus three x plus three x is plus six x. Three times three is plus nine. Ooh, trinomial equation. We should try to factor. It's the most elegant way, apple pie time. So if we're going to factor, we should set it to zero. Standard procedure with that. Go. Subtract five on both sides. Go. All right, I like to have the zero to the right, even though right now it's to the left. So symmetric property, reminder, if you change over the equals, we're permitted to do that. We'll get x squared, six x minus x is plus five x. Nine minus five is plus four equals zero. And now we can factor this trinomial x and x, multiply to x squared, multiply to four positive, add to five, both are positive, multiplies to four and adds to five, I'm feeling one and four. Set both to zero, both of these factors to zero, and we would get none other than x equals negative one and x equals negative four. Again, we must check, we must check. So I'm gonna do that now, create some space. Let's bring back the original equation. Let's call this check. We'll check over here. Square root of x plus five should equal x plus three. And over here, square root of x plus five should equal x plus three. You'll notice I didn't write the x's. I'm about to now. If x was negative one, would this be true? Feeling good about it. Negative one plus five is four. Square root of four is two on this side. Negative one plus three is two. All right, that works. Box that up. Throw a negative four now. Negative four here for x. And negative four here for x. Negative four plus five is one. Square root of one is one. Should be equal to negative four plus three is negative one. See what happened? Bang, didn't work. So, bye, <laughs> bye. All right, cool work. Note that that does happen on exams. Sometimes teachers like that, right? Said with respect to my fellow teachers. Sure, we should check for extraneous. We should totally check for extraneous because they exist. They should be checked. All right, let's go to the next. All right, next we are going to be talking about trigonometry. That loosely defined is the relationship between sides and angles in triangles. The first and foremost rule within trigonometry is what's called the Pythagorean theorem. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. This is a rule that pertains to right triangles. Here is a right triangle. It's a triangle having one right angle. A and B are the sides here, and they are often called legs. I'm gonna set them up. A equals something, B equals something, and C here, the longest side of the right triangle is called the hypotenuse. All right, let's come up with some numbers, okay? A classic Pythagorean triple, meaning a triangle that is a right triangle that honors Pythagorean theorem, is if one leg was three, another leg was four, and the hypotenuse is five. And you'll see that the three, four, five triangle works with Pythagorean theorem. Let's do it right now. So A and B are interchangeable, right? They're just the legs. In this case, I have A is three. So if we did three squared plus B is four squared, that should equal five squared. Let's see if it's true. Three squared is nine plus four squared is 16, should equal five squared is 25. Nine plus 16 is indeed 
25. So this is true. So that proves that Pythagorean theorem works with right triangles. We can use Pythagorean theorem for solving missing sides of triangles. Let's do that now. You'll notice the legs here are two and four, and we're missing C, the hypotenuse. So a good habit would be to start with that actual formula. Observe A squared plus B squared equals C squared. And we throw it down. Looks like the legs are two and four each. So this is two squared plus four squared equals whatever C is, C squared. Two squared is four plus four squared is 16. Four plus 16, 20 equals C squared. In order to get C by itself, we're going to take the square root of both sides. There you go. Whenever taking the square root of both sides, it requires what symbols? Plus or minus. Let's do it. I'm going to bring the C to the left. C equals plus or minus the square root of 20. 20 is not a perfect square. There's no number times itself that makes 20. So we do this little split technique and we find perfect squares hiding inside 20 that multiply to make 20. And I'm feeling four and five. So then you could say that that's the same as root four. Actually, let's go below which is the same as plus or minus root four times root five. And then that would be rewritten, simplified to plus or minus square root of four is two root five. And we keep in mind that normally, whenever taking the square root of both sides, we write plus or minus. Now we are in a physical space. Physical space meaning the length of this triangle. Could a length of a triangle, could the length of any sort of measurement actually be negative? No, it can't. So in the land of the real world with actual physical shapes, we're just going to be talking about the positive answer. So I'm going to take out my eraser here, take out all these plus or minuses, and we'll get 2 root 5 as the hypotenuse. Throw it down. 2 root 5. Let's do it again. As promised, we're going to write a squared plus b squared equals c squared. You'll notice that the hypotenuse in this case is given, and we're looking for another leg. This time I'll call it b just for fun. Here we go. So we have 2 squared plus b squared equals the square root of 6 squared, c squared. There it is, c. 2 squared is 4 plus b squared equals Square root of six times itself is six, any root times itself. Subtract four on both sides. B squared equals two. Square root both sides. We omit plus or minus because it's an actual length. B equals the square root of two. All right. Thank you, Pythagoras. So square root of two. Okay. All right, on with trigonometry. We have the classic trig functions called sine, cosine, and tangent, abbreviated as such with these three letters. And these are relationships between angles and sides within right triangles. We're going to talk about those relationships now. They are ratios. I'll show you what I mean. Sine of an angle, sine of an angle is defined as sine of an angle, sine of an angle results in a fraction or a ratio. I'm just going to write ratio. All right. So the sine of angle A, the sine of angle A is defined as the opposite side divided by the hypotenuse. The sine is defined as the opposite side divided by the hypotenuse. Let's put our three, four, five triangle in. So it helps, gives us actual real numbers to deal with. Let's put them here. Let's put three here, perhaps. Let's put four here and our hypotenuse five, the thing we did on the previous page. So now the sine of A is defined as the opposite of A right there, divided by the hypotenuse, which is five in this case. So this ratio is three over five, three fifths. Cosine of an angle, just like sine of an angle, equals a ratio. The same cosine of an angle also equals a ratio. And that ratio is defined as the adjacent side over the hypotenuse, A over H. Adjacent means next to. So let's say the side next to A, would you say it's three or four or five? What's the side next to A? 
In this case, you could see maybe it's four. So that would be adjacent over hypotenuse again, which is five. Cosine of A in this case is four fifths. And tangent of an angle is defined as opposite over hypotenuse. Oops, over adjacent. I said it right. There it is. Adjacent, opposite over adjacent. So we have those three sides designated with regards to A. A is looking out opposite to three. We said adjacent to A is four. So tangent of A would be three fourths. And this is an acronym that's been used over the generations called SOKATOA. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse, cosine adjacent over hypotenuse, and tangent opposite over adjacent. You can use that to help you solve right triangles. Wow, look at that. So now we're going to solve for X and Y. I'm going to grab our friend Sokotoa. Come on with us. And where are you? <laughs> That's nice. Yeah, we'll leave it right, right around there. Leave it there so we could see it. Okay, so we have 28. Sine or cosine or tangent. Let's say, let's experiment if I did sine sine of an angle, in this case, the angle that we know is 28 degrees, right, equals the ratio opposite over hypotenuse. The opposite side is y. Hypotenuse is 10. And look at that. Now we could solve for y. In this case, multiplying both sides by 10. Isolate y. Good. 10 divided by itself. Gaum! And we get y equals. So right, we can go straight to calculator for this. I'm going to throw down 10 sine of 28. Keep in mind that you want your calculator to be in a mode called degrees for angles in this case. There's other ways of measuring angles that's not degrees. Just make sure your calculator is in degree mode. Looks like I am. I'm going to round to tenths. One decimal place. I got 4.7. 4 and 7 tenths. Let's go ahead and try to get x involved. Well, now let's have some intention. From 28, x looks like adjacent. And we have hypotenuse 10. Which of these involve adjacent and hypotenuse? It looks like cosine. So in this case, we're going to rock out cosine. I'll do it over here. Cosine of 28 equals adjacent over hypotenuse, 10, x over 10. All right, and then multiply both sides by 10 again. This goes x equals whatever 10 times cosine 28 is. Degrees, right? That's all, it's degrees. And let's throw it down. 10 cosine 28, I'm getting, right, 8.8. .8. Okay, those are the two sides that are missing. Over here, solve, in this case, solving for an angle. We have not solved for an angle yet. We've been solving for sides. And I wanna remind you about this. I'm gonna bring this down, because this is actually really important for us. Let's cut it, come down. All right, and throw it here. Okay, sine of an angle equals a ratio. I'm gonna write that. Let's say sine of x degrees. You know what? If we're dealing with x, notice x is the angle, three is opposite and five is adjacent. So with regards to x, opposite and adjacent are actually tangent. So I'm gonna roll back the clock on this, click, 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 and go tangent of x equals, right, sine or cosine or tangent of an angle, there it is, tangent of an angle, equals the ratio, the ratio defined as opposite over adjacent, this is three-fifths. Okay, cool. Now look, can you go into the calculator and say tangent of x? Not really. We can't solve for this angle with plain old tangent. So we need to flip the narrative here and use a different trig function. Those are called inverse trig functions. I'll show you what that means. In this case, inverse sine, right? Notice it's sine to the negative one. You don't really say this negative one exponent. It's not an exponent. This is a notation. It's called inverse sine or arc sine. Sometimes you'll see, but I call it inverse sine. Inverse sine of a what equals a what? Flip the order inverse sine of a ratio 
results in an angle. I recommend students write this at the top of tests. You know, it really helps because it helps frame, right? And I'll ask you two leading questions. If you have the angle, regular trig or inverse trig? Regular. If you have the angle, regular trig. If you lack the angle, regular trig or inverse trig? Inverse trig. Observe, let's do it. So now let's go inverse trig, make a different color. Inverse tangent of what? Inverse trig of a ratio. The ratio we know this fraction is three fifths results in the angle. In this case is X, look at that. Now we can put something in the calculator. Inverse tangent of the ratio, da da da. Oh, I didn't do it right here. Often it's the second button on calculators. Inverse tangent of three fifths. And I have, oh wow, if I'm gonna round to the 10th, I have it rounding to 31 degrees. Actually, X serial. X is 31 degrees. There it is, rounded. We've got 30.96, so that rounds up. Okay, keep that in mind for when you need regular trig and when you need inverse trig. Onward. Next, we have rational functions. Rational, right? code for fraction feeling, right? Non-square roots, but I think of fraction entities in that case. Here's a bit of information as far as definitions. If two variables vary directly, then you could write A equals some constant times B. If A varies directly as B. Notice it's all on the same line. And if A varies inversely as B, then A equals K divided by B. What that means is if two numbers vary directly, in this case, A and B, that means as A goes up, B goes up. They go up together. Or as A goes down, B goes down. They go down together. That's a direct variation. Whereas here, when you vary inversely, as A goes up, B would actually go down, right? If this is a really big number, let's say, you'd have to have a small denominator to make that happen. Or if one goes down, the other goes up. So they go in opposite directions, right? Like puppeteer, right? Whereas directly they go up together and they go down together. Let's apply that application to this problem. Y varies directly as X would be Y equals KX. And we need to solve for K, the constant K. I always wondered why it's not C. What's up with the K constant? Maybe mathematicians not known for their spelling, but uh, Google that, let me know. Here we go, if Google still exists. <laughs> okay, if Y is 18 when X is two, here we go. Let's get that here, Y is 18, X is two. Notice I made Y 18, X two. So this is two K equals 18, divide both sides by two. I could do that for you. 2k equals 18, divide by 2, divide by 2. This goes to 1, and we get k equals 9. All right, round 2. Now it's no longer y equals kx, it's y equals 9x. See that? I made the k equal to 9. And now we could go into this part of the problem. What is y when x is 3? Here we go. So, 9 times. What is y when x is 3? y would be 9 times 3 is 27. There it is. So I like breaking it down into these into two pieces. One, solve for k, then come back, use that k, and solve for the missing variable. Let's go to the next. y varies inversely as x. Let's go ahead and write that. If you see varies inversely, the k would be now in the numerator y equals k over x. All right, if y equals 18 when x equals 2, oh, look at this, look, look. It's the same information. I love it. I love problems like this, side by sides, so we could see how they are similar and see how they're different. All right, here we go. In this case, we're going to solve for k just like we did before. If y equals 18 when x equals 2, throw it down. y equals 18, x equals 2. 
Multiply both sides by two to solve for K. This goes and we'll get K equals 18 times two. That would be K equals 36. Round one done over round two. Y equals 36 over X. See that? I took the K out. I put 36 in its place. Same thing. What is Y when X is three? That's cool. I like this type of problem. Really helps us see the difference between the two. What is Y? When x is 3, see that? y is, is what we're asking for. x is 3, and we get y equals 36 divided by 3. y equals 12. There it is. Direct and inverse variation. Moving. Moving again. Okay, more rational functions. We're going to graph y equals 2 divided by x. We need asymptotes and the domain. Okay, so there's something really important to talk about. We'll talk about asymptotes later. It's a fancy word, right? Let's talk about domain. The domain in this case, all possible x values. You could ask what is x allowed to be? Or a really directed question is what is x not allowed to be? What is x not allowed to be? x is not allowed to be 0 because the denominator is never allowed to be 0. So you could say that x is every number except 0. Where on the graph is that true? Let's get a little graph going. Click. All right. Move it down. Where on this graph is x equal to zero? Well, some students think of x as zero here, but if you think about it, there are other points where x is zero. Here x is zero. That's zero, one, zero, two, zero, three, zero, four, zero. Even down here, x is zero, x is zero, x is zero. What we're basically saying is all along this line, the graph is not permitted to cross. And you think about that, it makes sense. If the graph, let's say, went like that, that means the graph would go through 0, 4, hypothetically. But x is not allowed to be 0. So this dotted line serves as kind of an invisible force field, a barrier that the graph will never cross. Right? And that is code for asymptote. In this case, the vertical asymptote, let's put it over here. The vertical asymptote is this vertical line, and it's the vertical line x equals zero. You'll see a big link between the domain, what x can't be, and the asymptote itself, which makes sense because the graph can't go through it. So that's why there's a huge link between those. Let's talk horizontal asymptotes. Now, there's another asymptote. There's vertical, now let's talk horizontal. Okay, horizontally, what is a line that the graph will never cross? Let's say, think of like a plane landing, right? But never touching the tarmac. As X gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, two over a hundred, two over, two over a thousand, two over a million. Two over a million, you can even put in the calculator and prove two divided by a million is desperately, desperately close to what y value? y would equal that number. 2 over a million is super close to what integer? What number? It's super close to 0. So y would approach 0. 2 over x gets closer and closer and closer to 0, but it never will be 0. Right? I'll even challenge you. Can you think of a number right now to plug in for x? that would force y to be zero, right? Can't happen, okay? Which is why the horizontal asymptote is y equals zero. And that will happen whenever the denominator gets really, really, really big compared to the numerator. In this case, is just being still, stable at two. So here we have two asymptotes, a vertical one at x equals zero, horizontal one at y equals zero. What does the graph look like? Well, we could plot some points. Often it's helpful to plot around vertical asymptote, thinking of what x can be. So instead of x being zero, which you know x is not allowed to be, we could say x equals one, one to the right, and maybe one to the left. Two over one is two, y would be two. Let's plot that, one, two. And then two over negative one would be negative two, and that would be here, okay? And then if we wanted to be, and I show you how it would work, if I did a half, and if I did negative half, two over a half is 
four. Two over negative half is negative four. I'm showing you this for a reason. It would go like that. We come desperately close to the asymptote. Negative one half, negative four. And then like we said, let's make X 10 or negative 10. 10, negative 10 to show you the behavior of the graph. Two over 10 is one fifth. I'm also modeling to you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There. What the graph does at the extremes, right? Negative ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There. Okay. And so you get close to asymptote, but never touch. Close to asymptote, but never touch. And again, close to asymptote, but never touch. Hit, hit. Close to asymptote, never touch. That's the hallmark of what are called rational functions, rational graphs. We're going to use this information over here. Okay, now check that out. Domain, what is x not allowed to be now? x is allowed to be zero. The denominator would be fine. The, de the denominator would be negative one, that's fine. But in this case, x is not allowed to be the number one, that would force the denominator to be zero. And like we saw over here, there's a huge connection between vertical asymptote and the domain. So I predict, la la la, give it to me. Yeah, yeah, good. I predict that the asymptote will be at VA, let's put it right below, X equals one. Classically, what a lot of people do is they set the denominator to zero, often to get those vertical asymptotes. Okay, so now let's talk about the horizontal asymptote. Normally, the horizontal asymptote in a graph like this is y equals zero, right? Right there. This is the line y equals zero. You may recall from earlier, when you have minus two after the fact, do you recall that that's a type of translation? Do you recall it being up or down? Minus two, old school, minus two means down. So now we could say that the horizontal asymptote normally at y equals zero is now y equals negative two. Let's throw that down based on vertical shift. Beautiful. All right, and as promised, we are going to plot points around asymptote. Let's go over here and do it again. One to the right, one to the left would be a good practice. One to the right of this x equals one. I'm just gonna mark it x equals one. One to the right of that is three, and one to the, excuse me, two, and one to the left of that is zero. Yeah, right and left. I like to see what the graph does as it approaches, like what's the movement? The parties occur near asymptotes. You can see that, the parties are around the asymptotes. You should put that on your next invite. <laughs> the party's around the asymptotes, brah. And I said topes because that's cool. It's like slang. All right, here we go. When x is two, three over two minus one, three over one is three minus two is one. So that's at two, one, there it is. And zero, when x is zero, three over negative one would be negative three, minus two would be negative five. Okay, so zero, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so we can predict that the party will occur around the asymptotes. Oh, 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 oh. There's the party, that's not party music. Ta, 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 ta. Okay, we did it. Vertical asymptotes, horizontal, domain, and graph. Okay, here we go. All right, now we are simplifying. Rules for exponents. Here we go. Any time an exponent is negative, the rule is that expression, I'll circle it, will move to the denominator and the exponent will become positive. There's an entire rule and a, a, a proof about that, but I'm not gonna do that now. If you have any ne negative exponents, any part of the fraction, if it's upstairs, it'll move downstairs and become positive. If it's downstairs, it'll move upstairs and become positive, right? Think of it like someone being negative in the house and everyone's like, go downstairs and get a, grab a bite and become positive when you're down there. So I'm gonna rewrite this as 
negative four, and you still have times six x to the seventh over nine x to the ninth. And now we have x to the positive fifth down there. Okay, now let's implement our multiplication. Here we go. Negative four times six x to the seventh is negative 24 x to the seventh over x to the ninth times x to the fifth. What do we do with these powers? If you were to write them out, you'd see you'd have nine x's multiplied times five more x's multiplied, and that would lead to 14 x's multiplied, right? So these exponents would add, right? I use it in quotes because it's not an addition problem. It's a multiplication problem. But I do see that nine plus five equals 14. Okay, let's talk. Simplification, let's talk cancellation. Well, I got a little creative idea. Let's go back in time. How about what's the common factor between negative 24 and nine? What can divide into both? I'm feeling it's three. In fact, I don't need that thing. It's three. Okay, so three goes into this negative eight times. Three goes into this three times. So let's start it off negative eight thirds. If I wrote out seven x's multiplied and then 14 x's multiplied, seven of the total x's will cancel in the numerator and denominator, leaving seven downstairs, leaving x to the seventh downstairs. All right, we have to state what are called excluded values. We talked about that on the previous page, what x is not allowed to be. And if you look closely both here and down here, What's the singular value that x is not allowed to be? In this case, it's zero, because that would be zero to the seventh, which is zero, which would make the denominator zero. So I'm gonna write that down. X is not allowed to be zero. That's an important caveat. Let's do this over here. Go on, switch color. In order to simplify, the best thing that we could do is factor, right? Because then if you have common factors in the numerator and denominator, they're going to divide each other, cancel, leaving what's left. First step of factoring, look for a greatest common factor. In this case, 12 comes out. X plus what times 12 is 36 is three cool over. I see GCF greatest common factor. Again, I see two and that's X squared minus X minus 12, right? Looking at that little at a time. More factorization can occur, this trinomial factors. So I'm gonna kind of do everything as I go. 12 divided by two is six and one. That's cool, we can leave that. So coming on down, we have six times x plus three over. I don't need to write the one, I'm factoring this trinomial. What times what is x squared? Number that multiplies to negative 12 and adds to negative one. Think of those numbers, please. Multiply to negative, we have a negative and a positive. And the numbers that multiply to negative 12 and add to negative one are negative four and positive three. And look at that. X plus three divided by itself is one. It's always something so satisfying about that to do as common cancellations. Leaving, la la, six divided by X minus four. Excluded values coming. Let's go before we canceled anything, before we divided, we have two excluded values, right? Values that would force the denominator to be zero. In this case, X is not allowed to be positive four. I'm gonna write it. Because if X was four, that would be zero times. And that's not cool. Basically any of the factors that result in zero is what we want to avoid. What would X not allowed to be here? Negative three, so there's those. And finally, let's go back to this. Again, we're gonna do factoring. Difference of squares, do it. X plus five, X minus five over five minus X. I put in parentheses on purpose. You see, these are almost the same. They're not quite the same. They're not quite the same. They're very close. To prove how close they are, I'm going to factor this denominator to show you what will happen. Here we go, leave the numerator alone. X plus five times X minus five 
divided by, factor out negative one. What if I were to do that? Let's think what would happen. Negative one taken away or factored out of positive five would be negative five, right? Because negative one times negative five is five. I need a little bit of a line here. Let me see what we're doing. There you go. And then negative one times what is negative x. In this case, it would be plus x. Okay, if you distribute the negative one through this blue stuff here, you'll see it becomes five minus x. Now, this will be cool. Let's try some pro stuff. No, I don't wanna actually, I wanna keep my graph. <laughs> I got my graph copied, so I don't wanna do that. All right, so I'm gonna write it out again, right? S sweat it out x minus five over negative one times, reorder this commutative property, and we're gonna get x minus five. Look at that. Now they're the same. So we can divide these and they become one. So if you're dividing by negative one, right? You can, you're welcome to write it anywhere you want. You can go this x plus five, that's cool. This is x plus five, with the negative outside, or divided by negative one, you could distribute the negative, whatever you want, okay? A little pro tip, and we have to talk about excluded values in a second, but a cool pro tip is as follows. When you have it in this situation, see if this is okay for you. Can I go like this? Hey, goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. Hello. Okay. They are pretty much, they divide to negative one. Okay. So that's something that you can do going forward. All right. Excluded values. Look at the denominator. What is X not allowed to be? X can't be what? Five minus what would be zero. X is not allowed to be five. Okay. So there's our answer and excluded value. Go. Okay. More simplification, this time we're multiplying rational expressions or rational functions. And whenever multiplying fractions, let's look for what are called cross cancellations, common factors. And I see a lot in there, not only 21 and 12, but also 21 and 14, 12 and six. Let's have some fun with it. What's the common factor with 21 and 14? Seven. Seven goes into this three times. Seven goes into this two times. Let's do common factors for 12 and six is six. Six goes into this two times. Six goes into this one time. Let's talk bees. All right. B is the common factor. So one B cancels, leaving one of these Bs from B squared. And then how many X's will cancel? Think it through. How many X's are common in the numerator and denominator? X squared will go. Do I got more colors? Yeah, I do. I know it's kind of busy, but I'll clean it up. That would be a one and that would be X. So in cleaning it up, multiplying through, I get three times one is three over two times X times two times B. That would be four B X. There it is. Okay. A lot of action. Let's talk about, hmm, ooh, dividing fractions. Let's do that. The rule for dividing fractions is whenever we divide a fraction, it's the same as multiplying by that fraction's reciprocal. Reciprocal, remove numerator to denominator and denominator up. So this would be times 2x over x plus 3. And now we're back to this where we're looking for cross cancellations. Let's factor as we go. La la. X, it's kind of like turning into a factoring party, right? I told you factor is important. So much. Add to seven, multiply to 12. That'll be four and three, positive. Leaving 16x squared here, All right? In order to create nice space, let's go ahead and see what we have. This is my favorite part, right? Boom, boom, comes one. What else? Two and 16, I see. Two goes to one, two goes into this eight times. That's cool. I see X as well. How many X's go? 
one x will cancel out, leaving one of them here. Leaving us with what all over? We have x plus 4 over 8x. Yeah. And I forgot to do excluded values over on the left. Let's do that. So just look at the denominators here. x is not allowed to be 0, and b is not allowed to be 0. I'm just going to write that. x not 0, b not 0, all right, to be official. Again, over here, let's look at the denominators. Once we flip this, we see two x values before cancellation. Important to note, even before you cancel, you have to be mindful of what x is not allowed to be because we could have plugged that value in before we canceled and gotten a zero downstairs, which we have to be certain to not do. Okay, so looking at here, x is not allowed to be zero, and x is not allowed to be negative three. Box this up. Two more on this page. All right, now adding fractions. When adding fractions, we may not cross cancel any of that. When adding fractions, we need to establish common denominators. In this case, those denominators are already the same. So it's kind of good news for us. So we are permitted to combine these fractions, retaining the same denominator of x plus 4 into 2x plus 8. Now, we've been talking about the way these simplify is through the act of factoring. I notice this factors. First step in all factoring, look for a greatest common factor. 2 comes out 2 times. 2 times what becomes 2x plus 8? That would be x plus 4. Haha, <laughs> look at that. Super spesh. x plus 4 divided by itself is 1, and this results in the number 2. How about that? Regardless of what x is, x could be 1 or 5 or 10 or a million, this whole rational expression becomes the number 2. Being mindful that we're not permitted to plug in what x value? x is not still allowed to be negative 4. Okay. Now I want to add these, meaning I want to establish common denominator, but they're not the same yet, so we have some work cut out for us. Let's see if we can do that. Hmm. Oh, look, I see that factors too. But you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to factor that. I'm going to leave it. I'll show you what I mean. 2 comes out x plus 1 over plus x plus 1 over x minus 3. And uh, let's go here. Factors 2, x and x, multiply to negative 3, add to negative 2. That would be minus 3 plus 1. See, there's a little bit of a bonus here. See, these would technically cancel to 0 leaving x minus 3. So I would recommend doing that if you see that on a test or an exam or something like that. But I'm not going to cancel it just to get into teaching mode to, to prepare you for when something may happen, okay? How would we establish the same denominator here? Uh, well, we would need to multiply this by x plus 1. Not only that, oh, I have an idea. I think I know what I want to do. All right, you know what? I'm a, I am actually going to take my own advice because I'll have a chance to do this up next time, all right? Pro tips, let's do the math proper. Boom, divide one on both sides. Just to show you that that may happen, okay? Showing you it's a dynamic process here. And we have two over x minus three plus x plus one over x minus three. Yeah, I'm comfortable with this because we'll have a chance to do what I was about to do momentarily. Now we're permitted to combine these. Here we go. All over x minus 3. And now this all adds 2 plus x plus x plus 1. And then this becomes x plus 3 over x minus 3. This is our answer. This doesn't simplify or cancel anymore. Excluded values. x can't be 3. x can't be negative 1. And x can't be 3 again. Let's do it. x is not allowed to be 3. x is not allowed to be negative 1. All right. Still got gas in the tank? Let's go. We're almost there.
All right, onward with rational functions. Again, this time we are subtracting fractions and adding and subtracting fractions requires a common denominator. And this is that chance that we get to do what I was about to do on the previous page. And now we're gonna be forced to, you'll see. Here we go. So let's factor everything. X minus three over this factors two. X and X multiply to nine, add to six. That would be three and three. There it is, minus x minus nine over, this also factors, it's a difference of squares, x plus three, x minus three. Whoa, challenge. All right, what is the denominator that both of these denominators can multiply to become the least common denominator? That's what that's called. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to Create a little space over here. And I'm wondering about what that denominator would be. Well, we definitely know that x plus three needs to be in there because this denominator is like, yo, I need x plus three down there. So I'm gonna go like this and this one. That's true. In fact, I need a little more space because I feel like this denominator is gonna be pretty big. And over here, that's better. All right, so x plus three's gotta be down there. Also x minus three, like this denominator says, yeah, I need x minus three to already be there because otherwise I can't multiply to something without x minus three. So x minus three has to be in the common denominator. We'll put that there. All right. And sometimes students think like, oh, this is enough, right? This denominator is satisfied. This one's like, I'm cool. I can multiply it to make this. In fact, I'm gonna multiply by one. I don't need to do anything. I'm cool with this denominator, but this one's kind of upset because x plus three times x plus three can't multiply to make x plus three x minus three because we don't have enough x plus threes already down there. This denominator is like, what about my other friend x plus three? I have two. So you'll need that in there at least. So we need another instance of x plus three squared squared. Now each of these denominators can multiply to this common one. And let's prove it. Let's prove it. What does this fraction need, numerator and denominator, so that the denominator results in x plus 3 squared times x minus 3? All right, now that we've established that common denominator, x plus 3 squared times x minus 3, we ask what each denominator would need so that it becomes into our common denominator. Here we have x plus three and another one, so it lacks an x minus three. So that's what we're gonna to multiply top and bottom, x minus three here, x minus three here. Notice it has to be the same number, the same expression in the top and bottom, because that's like multiplying by one. And then over here, what does x plus three times x minus three need to become this? It looks like it needs another x plus three. So let's put that in, in there, x plus three here and x plus three here. Cool, okay, let's see what happens. Over here, x minus three times itself is x squared minus three x minus three x will become minus six x, negative three times negative three is plus nine, love it. And then here, let's distribute this. This would become x squared plus three x minus nine x becomes minus six x negative nine then times three. Distributive property is basically what we did, minus 27. Now that the denominators are the same, we can combine the fractions. Okay, let's write that denominator again. X plus three squared times X minus three. All right, here we go. X squared plus or minus six X plus nine minus all of this. So many students right, lose credit on tests and quizzes and things when they don't realize that this negative applies to the whole numerator. So technically speaking, it would be like this, minus X squared minus six X minus 27 minus the whole expression, okay? Which would require distributive property Okay, I'm gonna go over here. I know I lost the problem, but you're with me, you know, you get it. 
There you go. So we have x plus 3 squared times x minus 3. And we're getting x squared minus x squared. That would go negative 6x. Whoa, look at this. Will become minus negative 6x. That will become plus 6x. That also happens to go. And then we have 9 minus negative 27. This will be 9 plus 27. This would be 36. Wow. Look at that. So much evaporated, huh? And that is the result. Are we asked to do excluded values? We are. Let's go ahead and do that. X is not allowed to be negative 3 or positive 3. So let's just put that down. X is not allowed to be plus or minus 3. Okay, next. Whoa, and mixed fraction divided by mixed fraction. Whenever this happens, let's create some space for us. First of all, there's no excluded values because there's no value of x there. I'm just going to create some space for us. Okay. Turn these into improper. Okay. Three and a third, that would be 10 thirds. Three times three plus one. 10 thirds divided by how many ninths is two and one ninth? Well, you'd have 18 ninths there, two times nine plus one, 19 ninths. And a reminder, let's go through that process now. 10 thirds divided by 9 nineteenths. These are equivalent, which is the same as 10 thirds times the reciprocal, 9 nineteenths. Love it. Cross cancel action. 3 becomes 1. 9 becomes 3. 10 and 19, nothing else. Multiply across, and we'll get 30 nineteenths. Doesn't simplify further leave it. All right. So improper fractions are the way to go. Moving. More simplifications, adding fractions. We require a common denominator. Cool. You can do that. What's the common denominator between 1 and x minus 2? x minus 2. So this second fraction is cool. x minus 1, x minus 2. What does this need top and bottom multiplied? It needs x minus 2. So that denominator will become what we want it to be. So this is x minus 2, x minus 2. Distribute, multiply through. Let's do it. This actually becomes a difference of squares. So that's x squared minus 4 over x minus 2 plus that thing, plus this fraction here. All right, we already established common denominator. So I'm going to add across, and that would be x minus 2 down here x squared, what do we got? Like terms. Notice plus, so we don't have to distribute a negative in this case. So we have a plus x, and we have negative 4 minus 1 is minus 5. Worthwhile to always see, can we factor this? And hopefully, we'll get cancellations of common factors. And this looks to be prime. There's nothing that multiplies to negative 5 and adds to 1. So since it doesn't factor, we can leave it alone and say that's our answer. Excluded values, what is x not allowed to be? Can you tell us? x is not allowed to be 2. All right, good. Onward. All right, so now, same process. We have two fractions. We're adding them. Requires common denominator. So let's go ahead and get into our factoring. 2 comes out, greatest common factor. This is x plus 1 over plus. This doesn't factor anymore. This is x plus 1 over x minus 3. And now trinomial factoring. What multiplies? Put x and x first. Multiplies to negative 3, adds to negative 2. Oh, yeah, this is the same as what we did earlier, friends. So let's use this as an opportunity to solve it a different way. Remember, before I was hesitant to divide these so that they go away, and then I ended up doing it. Now let's actually pretend that we didn't see that. Let's pretend that we can solve it a different way. We actually can solve it a different way, and I'll show you that we'll end up with the same answer. What would the common denominator be if we insisted on leaving x plus 1 down there? It looks like it's x minus 3 times x plus 1. So I'm going to leave this fraction alone. x minus 3, x plus 1, 2 times x plus 1. OK, 
okay, plus what does x minus 3 need so that it becomes x minus 3? See, there's a lot of work required with this, see? So often this could take like a lot of screens, a lot of paper, right? There's a lot of action. So it needs x plus 1 top and bottom so that it will get x minus 3 times x plus 1. So it has no times x plus 1 over itself. And now you can see it, that we're going to multiply these two binomials. Here we go. It becomes x squared plus x plus x. This is plus 2x plus 1. And since we need to combine like terms, right, the fractions are the same in terms of their denominators, that is, I'm going to redistribute this, right? So this is 2x plus 2 all over x minus 3 times x plus 1, right? Since the denominators are the same, we've gone through that work, we're permitted to combine those numerators. There they are. So that's 2x plus 2 plus x squared plus 2x plus 1. Combine like terms. On we go into the next neighborhood. All right, like terms are uh-huh, x squared is fine. We have 2x plus 2x is 4x. And then we have 2 plus 1 is 3. Leave the denominator alone. x minus 3, x plus 1. And now we're going to factor the top if we can and hope that we get some cancellations. Ooh, we do. Look, tell us what that factors to. Leave this as x minus 3 down here, x plus 1. Worth another color. Yeah. What multiplies to x squared? x and x. Multiply to 3. Add to 4. Plus 3. Plus 1. Ah, it <laughs> worked again. Divided by itself is 1. Here's your answer. x plus 3, which is what we got before. I remember this. x minus 3. Very nice. With still excluded value the excluded values of 3 and negative 1 here. Okay, so we go back to it. x is not allowed to be 3. x is not allowed to be negative 1. Whew, okay. Okay, we got to actually do that. Worked out. Okay. Uh, adding fractions. Oh, do you remember that x minus 4 and 4 minus x are almost the same? Do you remember that let's say if I multiplied this by a negative, it would become x minus 4. Before we factored out negative 1, I'll even prove it to you by multiplying top and bottom of this by negative 1, right? And you'll see what happens. What we got? We got 3x over x minus 4 plus this becomes negative 12 over. Let's distribute negative 1 times 4 is negative 4. Ooh, reordering on the fly. Negative 1, distribute. Times negative x is positive x. Moving it to the front. Look at that. Okay? And that way, we get the same denominator. All right? And if you'd like, I could show you. You could change that to x minus 4 and throw a negative. That's what I do by now. I just write that as x minus 4 and throw a negative. Or this is kind of being formal about it multiplying top and bottom by negative 1. All right, we went through the trouble of creating the same denominator. We'll write it as that. Combine numerators, 3x minus 12. By now, are you thinking factor? Yes. So let's go ahead and factor this. 3 comes out. Leave that denominator. 3 times what? x minus 4. There, it happened again. I love problems like this. It just goes away, and we get the number 3 is the answer. Excluded value. Mm. What can't x be here? x can't be 4. What can't x be here? x can't be 4. Okay, there they are. Ooh, dividing fractions. So, dividing fractions, the same as multiplying by the reciprocal. Now, I'm going to take a risk here. Hopefully this is okay. Dividing by 
x squared minus 49 over x plus 1, goodbye, is the same as times the reciprocal of this. So I'm going to write x plus 1 over x squared minus 49. And this is what we're doing now, this stuff. Okay? And we're multiplying, so we don't need common denominators. We're going to factor, see what happens. So over here, we're going to get, switch it out, x minus 7 over factor x squared plus 3x plus 2. x, x, multiply to 2, add to 3, plus 2, plus 1, times x plus 1, leave it. Difference of squares, x plus 7. x minus 7. Right, once you get going, you start to realize that multiplying fractions is a lot more convenient than adding them because we don't need to establish common denominators when multiplying. Let's take out the red because I smell blood. Goodbye, one, like a shark. And goodbye, one. Anything else? Nope, okay. So the numerator will multiply to one. The denominators multiply. 2, x plus 2, times x plus 7. Some students wonder whether or not you should distribute this. I say you may, you don't have to. And the reason you don't have to is you're kind of communicating to the teacher that you would cancel more if you could, but since you can't, stop, you just walk away. And before we walk away, let's talk about excluded values in our original multiplication here. So we could see all the denominators clearly, right? These are all the denominators. It's the x plus 2, x plus 1, x plus 7, x minus 7. Lots of excluded. Oh, exclusivity. In math, it's okay. People, it's kind of hard. You know, you want to be welcoming. x is not allowed to be negative 2 or nor negative 1, nor plus or minus 7. There we go. There's that, and there's your answer. Okay, next. Ha, ah, I, <laughs> I knew that was coming, right? Hey, it's way easier to multiply fractions. So let's subtract them now. Ah. So we need common denominator. We're gonna do it. In order to establish common denominator, we are going to factor. Let's do. Factor this becomes, put in the middle there. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Multiply to negative six. Add to negative one is minus three plus two, right? That should work, yes. Over factoring this. First step in factoring, always look for a greatest common factor. We see one, it's x times x minus one. Danny, I'm gonna do you. Oh, okay, there's no cancellations. Minus, leave it as x minus five over x minus one equals x minus 3. Again, we'll do some factoring. Take out greatest common factor, x minus 1. Okay. On the left side of the equation, let's go ahead and establish common denominator. What's the smallest thing that this denominator and this denominator can multiply to become? It would be the denominator on the left. So this fraction needs an additional x. And since it needs it in the denominator, we multiply top and bottom by that. Here we go. Let's create a little space for us. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Times x over x. Okay, that's cool. I'm going to leave this as is. 2 over x. x minus 1 minus over x times x minus 1. Okay. And now look, yeah. See, here's a little tip that I forgot, and now through doing this, I'm gonna share it with you. It's definitely important to factor the denominators, of course, but the numerators, uh, you can maybe do without it sometimes because we're gonna have to combine. Check it, I'm gonna distribute this. I'll show you what I mean. Distribute x squared minus five x. You see that? There's going to be x squared chilling in here to combine with this. So with your permission, I'm going to roll back the clock. I'm going to take that off and put it back in its non-factored form. 
Okay, I'm gonna take this off. We can do that. We have authority. That's gone. Okay. So we got x squared minus x minus six. Okay, remember the distribution of the negative. That's important. So let's go ahead and exemplify that as such. I'm going to leave the denominator as is. Here we go. X squared minus X squared is gone. Okay, this goes. Negative X minus negative 5X. This would be plus 5X. So negative X plus 5X would be positive 4X, put it. And then we just have a minus 6. And then we could bring down our friend over here equals X minus 3 over X times X minus 1. Now you'll notice, look closely at that. The denominators are the same on both the left side and the right side of the fraction of the, of the equation. Okay. So can I multiply by whatever I want, hopefully to render this denominator obsolete? Let's multiply by the denominator itself. In slang terms, I've heard this called fraction busting, <laughs> like going through a wall. Fractions, goodbye. Much love, good, but goodbye. Because this fraction divided by itself goes, cancels to one. Same here. Leaving the numerators. Well, we got 4x minus 6 equals x minus 3. Solve for x. All right, minus x on both sides. You smell the finish line, friends. Oh. Plus six, plus six. Uh, uh, don't make a mistake now, Robert. <laughs> Although that would be fine. We show kindness to ourselves. Negative three plus six is three. And we get x equals one. Hit the brakes. What a way to end. What a way to end. Remember the excluded values things? In this case, let's look at the fraction here that's already factored. Do you agree that x is not allowed to be zero? Because that would make this zero in the denominator. And x is not allowed to be one. If you made x one here, this denominator would be zero because one minus one is zero times whatever is zero. Only candidate of, an, candidate of an answer that we have is x equals 1. But we're not allowed to let x equal 1, because that would make the denominator equal to 1, or I, that would make the denominator equal to 0. And thus, this solution is called extraneous. We talked about that prior. It's solutions that actually don't work, that have to be thrown away upon plugging in. So we say thank you, but no thank you. Bye. And the solution is that there is no solution. Boom. And what a way to end. I think that's it, friends. Oh my God, you did it. You did it, you did it. I have no idea how long this video is. I wanna congratulate you for taking this journey with me. Credit to you. Good luck on all your endeavors. Hey, let's make a message. Oh, hey, take this as a picture, post it on social, tag yay math, and it'll be our like a little like exclusive, like little inside club that no one knows. Here we go. It's like, I just make it thicker. Make it thicker. Here we go. Boom. More. Here we go. I just watched <laughs> a math video. <laughs> I got. Oh, you're going to be a insider now. That's, I don't know, hours long? Hours. Let's go. Hours long. <laughs> yay me. <laughs> and yay math. Come on, put it down. Yay. I'm going to make that thick too. Uh, yay. Tag me on this. Tag the yay math stuff. Yay math. All right, I'm going to smile for you. Post this. Oh, cool. Undo. Okay.
smiling, grab your shot. All right, much love. Thanks for being with me. Take care.